Tame a Scarred Baron. The Harrington Sisters, Book Two. Written by Abby Ailes and published by Starfall Publications. Available on our website and on Amazon. Enjoy! Chapter One Lady Evelyn stood in the shadows of Aunt Agnes's bedchamber, her heart heavy with the weight of impending loss. The room, once a sanctuary of warmth and laughter, now felt oppressive, its darkness mirroring the grim reality of Agnes's condition. The heavy curtains, drawn tight against the world outside, seemed to trap the very air within, making each breath a struggle. Agnes lay still upon her bed, her chest rising and falling in an uneven rhythm. Evelyn's gaze lingered on her aunt's frail form, so different from the vibrant woman who had swept into her life months ago. The silence was broken only by the laboured wheezing that Esker ped Agnes's lips, a constant reminder of the illness that had stolen her vitality. Evelyn's mind wandered to the plans they had made, now nothing more than wisps of smoke. America, with its promise of adventure and new beginnings, had seemed so tangible when Agnes first proposed the idea. They had pored over maps, debating which cities to visit, which sites to see. Agnes had spoken of introducing Evelyn to her circle of friends across the Atlantic, opening doors to a world far removed from the stuffy drawing rooms of London society. We'll make quite the pair, you and I, Agnes had declared, her eyes twinkling with mischief. They won't know what's hit them. But fate, it seemed, had other plans. Agnes's illness had come swiftly and without mercy, robbing her of the strength to even leave her bed, let alone embark on a transatlantic journey. Evelyn moved closer to the bed, her fingers whispering over Agnes's hand. Though not bound by blood, their connection ran deep. Agnes had taken her under her wing when Evelyn was adrift, offering guidance and affection without reservation. She had been more than an aunt. She had been a confidant, a mentor, a friend. Oh, Agnes, Evelyn whispered, her voice barely audible. What I wouldn't give to see you well again. Agnes's eyes fluttered open at the sound, a ghost of a smile touching her lips. For a moment, Evelyn saw a flicker of the woman she had been, strong, vivacious, unbound by convention. It was gone in an instant replaced by a look of pain and resignation. Evelyn swallowed hard, fighting back the tears that threatened to fall. She would be strong for Agnes, just as Agnes had always been strong for her. Yet as she watched her aunt struggle for each breath, Evelyn couldn't help but mourn for the future they would never share, the adventures left unexplored, the memories unmade. Evelyn quietly withdrew to a seat in the corner of the room smoothing her dress softly as she settled into the worn armchair. She cast a final glance at Agnes, relieved to see her aunt's eyes had closed once more, her breathing slightly steadier in sleep. With a heavy sigh, Evelyn reached into her pocket and pulled out a folded letter. The paper was crisp and its edges slightly worn from the countless times she had taken it out. She read it and tucked it away again without reply. Amelia's neat handwriting stared up at her, a reminder of the world beyond this sick room. Evelyn smoothed the letter on her lap, her eyes skimming over Amelia's warm inquiries about her well-being and tentative questions about her future plans. The caring words brought a lump to her throat. How could she explain the tumultuous events of the past weeks, the excitement of America dashed by Agnes's sudden illness? She reached for the small writing desk beside her, pulling out a fresh sheet of paper and a quill. For a moment she hesitated, the nib hovering above the page. Then, with a deep breath, she began to write. My dearest Amelia, I hope this letter finds you well. I apologise for my delayed response. Recent events have left me quite overwhelmed. I'm afraid I must share some distressing news. Dear Aunt Agnes has fallen gravely ill. Evelyn paused, her pen trembling slightly. She glanced towards the bed where Agnes lay motionless save for the shallow rise and fall of her chest. Turning back to her letter, she continued. 
Her condition worsens by the day, and I fear... I fear we may not have much time left together. Our plans for America have been set aside. Instead, I find myself playing nurse, watching helplessly as she slips away. Amelia, I confess I am at a loss. Aunt Agnes has been my anchor these past months, guiding me through the stormy waters of society with her wit and wisdom. The thought of a future without her counsel leaves me adrift. Evelyn set down her quill, staring at the words she had penned. The ink glistened in the dim light, a stark contrast to the pristine paper. She hesitated, her hand hovering over the letter as if to snatch it back and start anew. The melancholy tone of her missive weighed heavily upon her, and for a moment she considered tearing it to shreds. With a sigh, she dusted the letter with sand to dry the ink before folding and sealing it with a drop of wax. It wasn't fair to burden Amelia with such gloom, but the words had poured forth unbidden, a reflection of the fear that gnawed at her very core. Evelyn's gaze drifted back to Agnes's still form. The steady rise and fall of her aunt's chest offered little comfort. What would become of her when Agnes was gone? The thought sent a shiver down her spine, colder than any winter wind. She rose from her seat, pacing the room with silent steps. The walls seemed to close in, a physical manifestation of the uncertainty that threatened to suffocate her. America had been a beacon of hope, a chance to escape the suffocating expectations of London society. Now that dream lay in tatters, as fragile as Agnes's health. Evelyn's mind wandered to the judge, his stern visage looming in her thoughts. She could almost hear his voice, cold and unyielding, speaking of duty and family obligation. The mere thought of returning to his household, of being once more under his thumb, made her stomach churn. She pressed a hand to her mouth, stifling a sob. The fear she had been holding at bay surged forth, threatening to overwhelm her. Where would she go? What would she do? The questions swirled in her mind, each one more daunting than the last. Evelyn forced herself to take a deep breath, then another. She couldn't afford to fall apart, not now. Agnes needed her, and she would be strong for her aunt's sake. But in the gloom of Agnes' room, with only the sound of thick, syrupy breathing to keep her company, Evelyn allowed herself to acknowledge the truth she had been avoiding. She was afraid. Terrified, even. The future, once so bright with possibility, now loomed before her like a yawning chasm. At the edge of that chasm stood the judge, waiting to drag her back into a life she had fought so hard to escape. A week had passed since Evelyn sent her letter to Amelia, each day blurring into the next as she kept vigil at Agnes's bedside. The inevitable finally came in the early hours of the morning, Agnes slipping away with a quiet sigh that seemed to echo through the now silent room. Evelyn sat motionless in the chair beside the bed, her eyes fixed on Agnes's still form. The weight of grief pressed down upon her, threatening to crush her very soul. She had known this moment was coming, had tried to prepare herself, but nothing could have readied her for the stark reality of Agnes's absence. The world outside continued its relentless march forward, oblivious to the loss that had shattered Evelyn's world. She felt adrift, untethered from all that had anchored her. The future she had once dreamed of with Agnes by her side now seemed a cruel jest, mocking her with its impossibility. As the morning light crept through the cracks in the curtains, Evelyn's thoughts turned to the judge. The spectre of her past loomed larger than ever, a dark cloud on the horizon of her uncertain future. She shuddered at the thought of returning to that life, of once again being under his control. A knock at the door startled Evelyn from her grim reverie. She rose slowly, her limbs heavy with exhaustion and grief. Who could it be at this hour? She hadn't sent word of Agnes passing to anyone yet. Rather than rouse one of the servants, Evelyn went down to open it herself, groggy from grief and fear. Evelyn opened the door, her eyes widening in surprise as she beheld the familiar heart-shaped face before her, the calm blue-grey eyes and golden curls peeking out from beneath her bonnet. Amelia, she breathed, scarcely believing her eyes.
Without a word, Evelyn threw her arms around her friend, nearly knocking her off balance and clinging to her as if she were a lifeline in a storm-tossed sea. The tears she had been holding back for days finally broke free, and she began to sob, her whole body shaking with the force of her grief. Amelia gently led Evelyn into the drawing room, her touch a comforting anchor in the chaos of emotions. Evelyn sank onto the settee, her body trembling with exhaustion and grief. Amelia sat beside her, still holding her hand, a silent pillar of support. Oh, Amelia, Evelyn whispered, her voice cracking. I don't know what to do. I just have nowhere to go, nothing to hide behind. She looked down at her hands clenched tightly into the folds of her skirt. What if the judge finds me? What if... Amelia reached out and clutched Evelyn's hand, squeezing reassuringly. You're not alone, Evelyn, she said softly. We'll figure this out together. Evelyn took a deep, shuddering breath, trying to calm herself. Amelia's presence was a balm to Evelyn's raw nerves, her quiet strength a reminder that not all was lost. She continued to fret inwardly, her body still tense as if preparing to flee. Amelia listened to all of her anxieties, murmuring sympathetic sounds. The first light of dawn was creeping through the windows when Evelyn felt her eyelids growing heavy. She fought against the exhaustion, afraid that if she closed her eyes, she'd wake to find Amelia gone and herself alone once more. But sleep was a relentless foe. As Amelia's soothing voice washed over her, Evelyn felt herself drifting off, her head coming to rest on her friend's shoulder. Her last conscious thought was one of gratitude for Amelia's unwavering support. As Evelyn drifted off against the unstoppable tide of sleep, she could just hear Amelia saying, I may have an idea. Evelyn awoke with a start, momentarily disoriented by the unfamiliar surroundings. The events of the previous night came rushing back, and she felt a fresh wave of grief wash over her. Agnes was gone, and the world seemed a colder place for it. Forcing herself to rise, Evelyn dressed quickly, her movements mechanical. There was work to be done, no matter how much she wished to hide away from the world. Agnes's great-nephew, a man Evelyn had never met, was eager to claim his inheritance. The thought of it made her stomach churn. As she left the drawing room, she found Amelia already at work, a white dust cloth draped over her arm. The sight of her friend brought a small measure of comfort to Evelyn's aching heart. Good morning, Amelia said softly, her eyes filled with concern. I've begun in the drawing room. How shall we proceed? Evelyn took a deep breath, steeling herself for the task ahead. We'll need to take inventory of everything, she replied her voice hoarse from crying. And settle the servants' accounts. The new master of the house will want a clean slate, I'm sure. They moved through the rooms methodically, Evelyn's heart constricting with each familiar object they catalogued. Every piece of furniture, every trinket, held a memory of Agnes. Amelia worked quietly beside her, offering silent support as she draped dustcloths over chairs and tables. In Agnes's study, Evelyn paused before her aunt's writing desk. How many letters had Agnes penned here, full of wit and wisdom? How many plans had been made at this very spot? Plans that would now never come to fruition. The funeral, Evelyn said suddenly, her voice tight. It's to be held the day after tomorrow, far too soon if you ask me, but the great-nephew insists. Amelia looked up from the ledger where she'd been noting the contents of the room. That seems awfully rushed, she agreed, frowning. Surely he could wait a few days more? Evelyn shook her head, bitterness creeping into her voice. Apparently not. He's eager to take possession of the house. Agnes is barely cold, and already he's counting his inheritance. She turned away, blinking back tears. The thought of strangers living in Agnes' home, using her things, sleeping in her bed, it was almost too much to bear. But what could she do? She had no claim here, no right to protest. As they continued their work, Evelyn found herself growing increasingly agitated.
the hurried funeral arrangements, the eager great-nephew, the methodical dismantling of Agnes's life. It all felt wrong, disrespectful to the woman who had meant so much to her. As Evelyn and Amelia worked through the morning, the repetitive nature of their task provided a welcome distraction. Evelyn was trying to focus on each item, carefully noting its description and value, leaving little room for her mind to wander to darker thoughts. The constant movement from room to room, the scratch of pen on paper, and Amelia's quiet presence beside her created a bubble of focused activity that kept her anxieties at bay. It wasn't until they paused for a light luncheon that Evelyn's mind began to drift. As they sat in the kitchen, picking at cold meat pies neither of them had much appetite for, Evelyn suddenly remembered Amelia's words from the night before. Amelia, she said, setting down her barely touch plate. Last night, just before I fell asleep, you mentioned something about an idea. What did you mean? Amelia's hand paused midway to her mouth, a flicker of uncertainty crossing her face. She lowered the sandwich, her brow furrowing slightly, as she seemed to consider her words. Well, Amelia began, her tone cautious. I'm not entirely sure it's a suitable solution, but... She trailed off, her eyes darting away from Evelyn's gaze. Evelyn leaned forward, curiosity piqued. Go on, she encouraged, desperate for any glimmer of hope in her current situation. Amelia took a deep breath before continuing. I recently came across a job posting in the newspaper. It's for a governess position in the West Country at a baron's household. Evelyn blinked, taken aback. A governess, she repeated, the word feeling foreign on her tongue. She had never considered such a role for herself, having been raised to expect a life of leisure in society. I know it's not what you're accustomed to, Amelia said quickly, but it could provide you with a respectable position, away from London and certain individuals. Evelyn's mind whirled at the prospect. A governess? The idea seemed almost laughable, yet the promise of distance from London from the judge and whatever lackeys of his might still be lurking there, was undeniably tempting. I... I don't know, Amelia, she said, her voice hesitant. I've never even considered such a role. And children? I hardly know the first thing about them. Memories of her own rigid upbringing flashed through her mind. Stern-faced nannies, endless lessons in etiquette and deportment the constant pressure to be the perfect little lady. She had never truly experienced childhood as most would understand it. Amelia leaned forward, her eyes bright with encouragement. Oh, come now, Evelyn. It's not as daunting as you might think. Besides, how much can a country baron truly expect in terms of manners? I'm sure you're more than qualified to teach a child which fork to use for fish. Evelyn couldn't help but smile at her friend's enthusiasm. Still, doubt gnawed at her. But how would I even secure such a position? I have no experience, no references. A mischievous glint appeared in Amelia's eyes. Well, she said, lowering her voice conspiratorially, I could write you a letter of reference. It wouldn't be lying, exactly, just embellishing the truth a bit. Evelyn's eyes widened. Amelia! You can't be serious. Why not? Amelia replied, her tone light but her eyes serious. You're intelligent, well-educated and more than capable of instructing children. The fact that you haven't done so before is merely a technicality. Evelyn bit her lip, considering. It was a mad idea, surely. And yet, the thought of escaping to the countryside, far from the judge's reach, was undeniably alluring. Perhaps in such a setting, she could finally breathe freely, find her footing in a world that had suddenly become so uncertain. Wordlessly, she nodded, and with a simple gesture, her future was decided. Outwardly, she maintained her calm exterior, but inwardly, her stomach roiled and clenched nervously, the few bites of the meat pie turning to lead. Despite her best efforts, she was once again cast adrift her future in the hands of others.
Chapter 2 James Ailes, Baron Hastings, stood at the edge of the field, his keen grey eyes surveying the assembled farmers and farmhands. The late summer sun beat down upon them, casting long shadows across the freshly ploughed land. A gentle breeze rustled through the nearby trees, carrying with it the scent of earth and green things. Before the group, a man in a crisp black suit gesticulated wildly, his voice rising and falling as he expounded upon the virtues of some newfangled drainage method. James observed the dubious expressions on the faces of his tenants, their weathered brows furrowed in scepticism. And so, gentlemen, by implementing this innovative system, you'll see a marked improvement in crop yield within the first season. The man in black concluded with a flourish. A low murmur rippled through the crowd. James caught fragments of hushed conversations, peppered with words like nonsense and waste of time. He suppressed a sigh, running a hand through his dark hair. Any questions? the suited man asked, his enthusiasm undimmed by the lukewarm reception. Silence fell over the gathering. James could practically feel the weight of unasked questions hanging in the air. He cleared his throat, drawing all eyes to him. Perhaps Mr Hodgson might share his thoughts, James suggested, nodding towards a grizzled farmer near the front. Hodgson tugged at his cap, clearly uncomfortable with the attention. Begging your pardon, my lord, but we've been draining these fields the same way for generations. Why change now? The man in the suit launched into another explanation, but James tuned him out. He studied the faces of his tenants, noting their barely concealed frustration. They were good people, hard-working and loyal. They listened out of respect for him, but their patience was wearing thin. James felt a familiar tightness in his chest. He wanted to do right by these people, to ensure the estate prospered for the sake of his daughters. But change was a delicate thing, especially in a community as rooted in tradition as this one. That's enough for today, James interrupted his voice carrying across the field. Thank you for your time, gentlemen. We'll discuss this further in private. Relief washed over the crowd as they began to disperse. James caught snippets of conversation as they passed. Right waste of an afternoon, that was. The Baron's a good sort, but this newfangled nonsense. My granddad would be rolling in his grave if he heard all that rubbish. James watched them go a mixture of fondness and frustration warring within him. The estate had to move forward, but how could he convince them when they were so set in their ways? James watched the last of his tenants disappear into various cottages and barns, their grumbling voices fading into the distance. The weight of responsibility settled on his shoulders like a physical burden, and he exhaled slowly, his eyes scanning the fields stretching out before him. The land looked parched, even after the recent rains. Two years of poor harvests had left their mark, not just on the soil but on the faces of his people. James could see the worry etched into their weathered features, the fear of what another bad year might bring. He ran a hand over his face, feeling the rough texture of his burn scar beneath his fingers. The memory of fire flickered at the edges of his mind, but he pushed it away. There were more pressing concerns than old wounds, starvation, poverty. The words echoed in his head, grim spectres that haunted his every decision. James was no stranger to loss, but the thought of failing those who depended on him sent a chill through his body despite the warmth of the day. He turned away from the fields, his boots crunching on the dry grass as he made his way back towards the manor. The new drainage system could make all the difference, he knew that. But convincing the farmers to embrace change was like trying to move a mountain with his bare hands. James's face was clouded with concern as he walked, his mind churning over the problem. He was a man of few words by nature, preferring action to lengthy speeches. But perhaps that was part of the issue. His tenants needed more than just a silent, brooding landlord. They needed reassurance guidance. The thought of opening up, of sharing his concerns and hopes with them, made James's stomach clench.
He'd kept people at arm's length for so long, it was second nature now. But if it meant the difference between prosperity and ruin for his estate, for his daughter's future. James paused, looking back over his shoulder at the fields. The sun was setting now, casting long shadows across the land. In the fading light, he could almost see the ghosts of better years past, of abundant harvests and content faces. With a quiet determination, James set his jaw and continued towards the manor. He had decisions to make, and they couldn't wait. The fate of his people, his legacy, hung in the balance. As was his habit, he walked with his head down and tilted slightly to the side. It was a posture unconsciously done these days to minimise the view of the burned side of his face. James strode towards the manor, his hands clasped tightly behind his back lost in thought. The weight of his responsibilities pressed down upon him, each step feeling heavier than the last. He pondered the challenge of convincing his tenants to embrace change, the risks of another poor harvest, and the uncertain future that loomed before them all. So engrossed was he in his musings that he failed to notice the approaching figure until she was nearly upon him. Mrs. Turnbell, his housekeeper, bustled up the path, her face flushed, and her usually neat white cap askew. My lord, she called out, her voice strained, I must speak with you at once. James halted, surprised by her sudden appearance and the clear agitation in her manner. What is it, Mrs. Turnbell? The housekeeper drew herself up her chest heaving with exertion, and what James suspected was barely contained frustration. I regret to inform you, my lord, that your girls are simply unmanageable. I cannot. I will not mind them any longer. He blinked, momentarily at a loss for words. The girls had always been spirited, yes, but unmanageable. And to have Mrs. Turnbell, who had been with the family for years, refuse to look after them. Surely it can't be as bad as all that, James said, trying to keep his voice level despite the worry gnawing at his insides. Mrs. Turnbell's eyes flashed. With all due respect, my lord, it is precisely that bad. You've no idea the sort of mischief they get into these days. Why, just this morning I found one of them, well, it won't bear repeating, but suffice to say if they were my children I'd... Thank you, Mrs. Turnbell, I believe I understand the way of it. James felt a headache building behind his eyes. Reflexively, he turned away slightly, his jaw working. He had known the girls were becoming more difficult to handle. But he had hoped. What? That the problem would simply resolve itself? He suppressed a sigh, acutely aware of Mrs. Turnbell's expectant gaze. James felt his jaw tighten as he considered Mrs. Turnbell's words. Surely this was just a passing phase. The girls were growing, testing their boundaries. It was natural, wasn't it? Now, Mrs. Turnbell, he began, trying to keep his voice calm and reasonable. I'm sure it's not as dire as all that. Perhaps if we... But the housekeeper cut him off with a sharp shake of her head. Begging your pardon, my lord, but it is precisely that dire... I have my own duties to consider, and I simply cannot be chasing after your daughters at all hours of the day and night. James felt his shoulders sag slightly. He knew Mrs. Turnbell was right, but the thought of admitting it aloud made his throat constrict. What would you suggest then? he asked, though he feared he already knew the answer. A governess, my lord, Mrs. Turnbell said firmly. Someone who can devote their full attention to the girl's education and behaviour. James drew up short, his whole body tensing at the suggestion. A governess? A stranger in his home? Privy to their private lives, to the girls' vulnerabilities? The very idea made his skin crawl. He opened his mouth to refuse outright, but his eyes caught sight of the bare fields stretching out beyond the manor grounds. The dry, cracked earth seemed to mock him, a stark reminder of all that hung in the balance. His mind began to wander, calculations of crop yields and potential losses clouding his thoughts. My lord, Mrs. Turnbell's voice cut through his distraction, what shall I do about the girls? James blinked, forcing himself to focus on the matter at hand. The fields could wait. <laughs>
For now, he had to address this more immediate concern. But even as he tried to formulate a response, he could feel his attention slipping away again, drawn inexorably back to the problems of the estate. James felt the weight of Mrs. Turnbell's words settle upon him like a yoke. His mind raced, torn between the pressing concerns of the estate and the immediate issue of his daughter's behaviour. He opened his mouth to speak, but Mrs. Turnbell, her patience clearly at an end, cut him off. My lord, if you won't consider a governess, then I'm afraid there's only one other option, she said, her voice firm. The girls will have to be sent away to finishing school. The words hit James like a blow to the chest. His breath caught, and a cold, creeping fear gripped his heart. The thought of his daughter's leaving, of being sent away from him, was unbearable. There wasn't much that he feared. The idea, though, of his girls being taken from him was one that never failed to make him break out into a cold sweat underneath his crisp linen shirt. He felt his face harden, muscles tensing as he struggled to maintain his composure. The scar on his face pulled a little tightly as he worked to keep his expression blank, a stark reminder of loss and the fragility of life. With a Herculean effort, James forced his features into a mask of stern resolve. When he spoke, his voice was low and controlled, betraying none of the turmoil within. Very well, Mrs. Turnbell. I will consider candidates for a governess. The words tasted like ash in his mouth, but he knew it was the only way. He would not, could not, send his girls away. The risk was too great, the potential for loss too devastating to contemplate. Mrs. Turnbull nodded, relief evident in her posture. A wise decision, my lord. Shall I begin making inquiries? James gave a curt nod, not trusting himself to speak further. As Mrs. Turnbell hurried away, he turned his gaze back to the fields, his mind already grappling with this new challenge. A governess, a stranger in his home. But better that than the alternative, he thought grimly. Better that than losing his girls forever. James made his way back to the manor, his mind still wrestling with the prospect of hiring a governess. As he approached the grand oak doors, he noticed an unusual stillness about the place. No sounds of laughter or running feet echoed through the halls. No shrieks of childish delight rang out from the gardens. The silence was, in his experience, rarely a good sign. With a weary sigh, he pushed open the door and stepped into the cavernous entrance hall. The quiet seemed to press in on him from all sides, broken only by the soft ticking of the grandfather clock in the corner. I hereby declare, James called out, his voice echoing through the house that any guilty parties involved in mischief-making who present themselves in my study within the next ten minutes shall be shown leniency. For a moment the silence persisted. Then from somewhere deep within the house, a barely suppressed giggle broke free. James recognised it instantly as Julia's, his lips twitching despite himself. That girl could never quite contain her mirth, even in the direst of circumstances. And what terms are you offering for this amnesty? Augusta's voice floated down from above, cool and measured. James tilted his head, trying to pinpoint her location, but his eldest daughter remained hidden from view. Full amnesty, James replied, his tone firm but not unkind. No punishment. A clean slate, as it were. There was a pause during which James could almost hear the gears turning in Augusta's head. Then primly, she spoke again. Very well. We accept your terms, father. James sighed heavily as he retreated to his dressing room, his boots echoing on the polished floors. Not bothering to ring for his valet, he shrugged off his brown jacket, still warm from the afternoon sun, and changed into a fresh shirt and waistcoat. The weight of the decision he'd made pressed upon him, but he steeled himself for the conversation ahead. Returning to his study, James was unsurprised to find his twin daughters standing before his desk, the picture of innocence. Julia fidgeted slightly, her eyes darting around the room, while Augusta stood perfectly still, her gaze fixed on him. They wore matching light blue pinafores with halos of golden red curls that refused to stay plaited. He sat behind his desk, eyeing them sternly. Girls, he began, 
his voice low and measured. Your behaviour of late has been... concerning. Julia opened her mouth to protest, but James silenced her with a look. Augusta's eyes narrowed almost imperceptibly. Your tendency to act like wild boys rather than young ladies has left me with no choice, James continued. I've decided to engage a governess to... civilise you. The words hung in the air for a moment before both girls erupted in protest. Father, you can't, Julia cried. This is completely unnecessary, Augusta began. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favour. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now back to our story. James held up a hand and the room fell silent once more. He met each of their gazes in turn, his expression unyielding. This is not a discussion, he said firmly. I am informing you. Augusta, ever the strategist, spoke first. You said we wouldn't be punished, she said with just the hint of a pout. James felt a flicker of pride at her quick thinking, even as he shook his head. This is not a punishment, Augusta. It's... it's an opportunity. An opportunity to learn, to grow, to become the young ladies I know you can be. The words tasted hollow in his mouth, and James wondered if he truly believed them himself. He watched as his daughters exchanged glances, a silent conversation passing between them. May we go, father? Julia asked, her voice uncharacteristically subdued. James nodded, and the girls filed out of the study, closing the door behind them with a soft click. Alone once more, James leaned back in his chair running a hand over his face. He hoped, desperately, that he had been truthful in his words to Augusta, that this governess, whoever she might be, wouldn't be a punishment for all of them. Chapter 3 The carriage jostled along the rutted road, each bump and sway a stark reminder to Evelyn of how far she was travelling from the familiar streets of London. She gazed out the window, watching as the sprawling city gave way to rolling hills and patchwork fields. The further they went, the tighter her chest felt, a growing knot of anxiety twisting in her stomach. Evelyn clutched her reticule, her fingers tracing the outline of Amelia's letter within. The offer had seemed a godsend at first, a chance to start anew to bury the whispers and sidelong glances that had dogged her steps in town. But now, as London faded into the distance, Doubt crept in like a chill. I say, are you quite all right, miss? Evelyn startled, realising she'd been staring unseeing at her fellow passenger. The elderly gentleman peered at her with concern. It was a little unnerving, having a strange man speak to her without an introduction. His eyes, though, crinkled in a friendly manner that put her at ease. Perfectly fine, thank you, she managed, forcing a smile. Just taking in the scenery. He nodded, settling back into his seat. First time to the West Country, is it? Is it that obvious? Evelyn asked, self-consciously reaching up to adjust her bonnet. Oh, most visitors have that same look about them, he chuckled, like a fish suddenly finding itself on dry land. Evelyn's smile faltered. That was precisely how she felt. Out of her depth, and gasping for air. The thought of being so isolated, so far from the bustle and life of the city, made her heart race. What if she couldn't adapt? What if the quiet drove her mad? The carriage lurched, and Evelyn gripped the seat. She'd grown up navigating cobblestone streets and crowded markets. How would she manage muddy lanes and open fields? The air already smelled different. Earthy and green, lacking the familiar tang of coal smoke and river muck. As they passed through a small village, Evelyn caught sight of women gossiping by a well. Their curious glances followed the coach. She shrank back, suddenly aware of how her London fashions would stand out. Every eye would be upon her, the newcomer, in a place where everyone knew everyone else's business. She'd spent a few days with Amelia in London, packing away her finest dresses. However, it was immediately obvious that even the more sedate ones she'd packed would draw attention. 
Evelyn took a deep breath, trying to quell her rising panic. She'd made her choice. There was no turning back now. But as the coach rolled on, carrying her deeper into the unknown, she couldn't help but wonder if she'd made a terrible mistake. Evelyn shook herself from her reverie, cheating herself for her doubts. It was too late for all that now. She'd made her decision, and there was no use in fretting over it. The countryside rode by, a patchwork of greens and browns that blurred together as the coach rumbled on. At each stop, more passengers disembarked, until Evelyn was left alone in the carriage. The silence pressed in around her, broken only by the creak of wheels and the steady clip-clop of hooves. She shifted uncomfortably on the hard seat, her body protesting after days of travel. As the journey stretched on, Evelyn's discomfort grew. Her muscles ached and her head pounded from the constant jostling. She longed to stretch out, to walk more than the few paces afforded during their brief stops. But she endured, reminding herself that each mile brought her closer to her new life. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the coach lurched to a halt. Evelyn peered out the window, her heart quickening as she realised this must be her stop, the last stop on the route. She gathered her belongings with trembling hands, suddenly unsure of what awaited her beyond the carriage door. As Evelyn stepped down, her legs wobbled beneath her, stiff from the long journey. She steadied herself against the side of the coach, blinking in the bright sunlight. Before she could get her bearings, a loud thud made her jump. The coach driver had unceremoniously hauled her trunk from the roof, dropping it with a splash into the muddy road. Evelyn let out an involuntary squeak of alarm, her eyes widening at the sight of her precious belongings now sitting in a puddle. The coach driver merely grunted at her distress, shrugged, and disappeared into a small tavern that faced the muddy road. Evelyn stood rooted to the spot, her gaze darting from one unfamiliar sight to another. The village, if one could call it that, consisted of a mere handful of buildings scattered haphazardly along the muddy road. A weathered sign creaked in the breeze, its faded letters barely legible. The tavern where the coach driver had disappeared seemed to be the only sign of life. Her heart raced as the reality of her situation sank in. She was utterly alone, with no idea where to go or whom to turn to. The weight of her decision pressed down upon her, threatening to crush what little resolve she had left. Evelyn fought back the urge to cry, knowing it would do her no good. Just as panic began to set in, the clip-clop of hooves drew her attention. A wagonette rolled to a stop beside her, driven by a sturdy man whose face was hidden beneath the brim of a wide hat. He made no move to look at her directly, seeming content to chew on the piece of straw protruding from his mouth. Evelyn cleared her throat, hoping to catch the man's attention. Excuse me, sir. I'm looking for... The man cut her off with a grunt, still not meeting her gaze. You'll be the new governess, then? His gruff manner caught Evelyn off guard. She straightened her spine, reminding herself that despite her current circumstances, she was still a lady. Yes, I am. L. Miss Bain, she said, hurriedly correcting herself. Here to... Another grunt interrupted her. The man jerked his thumb towards the back of the wagonette. Best get in, then. Evelyn hesitated, eyeing the muddy wheels of the wagonette and her trunk still sitting in a puddle. My luggage. The man turned his face slightly toward her, revealing part of a scarred face. Evelyn took an involuntary step backward. I'll see to it. You just get yourself settled. Evelyn eyed the mud-splattered wagonette with growing dismay. The wooden bench exposed to the elements bore a patina of grime that made her skin crawl. She hesitated, glancing down at her travelling dress, one of her plainer ones, but still far too fine for such rough accommodations. With a resigned sigh, she gathered her skirts and gingerly placed her foot on the step. The wagonette creaked ominously as she hauled herself up, and she winced at the thought of what this jarring ride might do to her already aching muscles. As Evelyn settled onto the hard bench, a horrifying realisation dawned. There was no separate seat for passengers, just this single, narrow perch.
She'd have to sit right next to the driver, mere inches from this gruff, scarred stranger. Her heart began to race. This was improper, indecent even. What would people think, seeing her arrive in such a manner? She'd hoped to make a good first impression to establish herself as a lady of refinement despite her new position. Instead, she'd be perceived as some common trollop, practically in the lap of the first man she'd encountered. Evelyn's fingers twisted in her lap as she fought the urge to leap down and flee. But where would she go? She was utterly lost in this strange, muddy village. The driver finished securing her trunk and climbed back up. Evelyn held her breath as he settled beside her, his bulk causing the bench to shift. She pressed herself against the side of the wagonette, desperate to maintain some semblance of propriety. The scent of hay and horses filled her nostrils as the driver clicked his tongue, urging the horse forward. Evelyn sat rigidly, her spine straight as a poker, refusing to lean back lest she brush against her silent companion. As they lurched out of the village, Evelyn's mind raced. What sort of place was she going to, where this was considered an acceptable way to transport a governess? She thought of Amelia's letter, full of warm assurances about the kindness of her new employers. Had her friend been mistaken? Or worse, had she deliberately misled Evelyn about the nature of this position? Evelyn couldn't help but steal glances at the driver as they rattled along the rutted road. Despite her discomfort, she found herself impressed by his ease with the reins. His hands rested lightly on the leather straps, guiding the horse with the barest of movements. It was clear he knew these roads like the back of his hand. The man's foot was propped up on the footboard, his posture relaxed despite the constant jostling. Evelyn envied his comfort, acutely aware of her own rigid posture. She shifted slightly, trying to find a position that didn't leave her bouncing like a rag doll with every bump and dip in the road. As she fidgeted, her skirts rustled against the rough wood of the bench. She winced, imagining the state her dress would be in by journey's end. Another bump sent her lurching sideways, and she barely caught herself before colliding with the driver's solid frame. Something wrong, miss? The gruff voice startled her. It was the first time he'd spoken since they'd set off. Evelyn straightened, smoothing her skirts with trembling hands. No, not at all, she lied, forcing a smile. I'm simply adjusting to the ride. The driver grunted, his eyes never leaving the road ahead. Not used to country travel, I reckon. Evelyn felt her cheeks flush. Was her discomfort so obvious? She'd hoped to maintain some semblance of dignity, but it seemed she was failing miserably at every turn. I confess it is rather different from what I'm accustomed to, she admitted, trying to keep her voice steady as they jolted over another rut. Evelyn bit her lip, trying to regain her composure. The driver's blunt observation stung, but she couldn't deny its truth. She was woefully unprepared for this new world. What did you expect, miss? the driver asked, his tone gruff but not unkind. The question unleashed a torrent of frustration that Evelyn had been struggling to contain. I expected, she began, her indignity rising. I expected that a baron would have at least had the decency to send a proper carriage, perhaps even a female servant to meet me. The words tumbled out, gaining momentum. Is this truly how a gentleman of his standing treats his employees? And these roads, they're hardly fit for beasts, let alone people. There's mud everywhere, coating everything. How does anyone manage to keep clean? Evelyn knew she was being unladylike, complaining so vociferously to a stranger, but she couldn't seem to stop herself. The discomfort of the journey, the uncertainty of her future, and the shock of her new surroundings all conspired to loosen her tongue. I've never seen such a state of affairs, she continued, gesturing at the rutted road before them. How can anyone live like this? It's barbaric. The driver remained silent throughout her tirade, his eyes fixed on the road ahead.
His lack of response only fueled Evelyn's indignation, and she found herself listing every perceived slight and inconvenience she'd encountered since stepping off the coach. Finally, Evelyn fell silent, her cheeks flushed with emotion and embarrassment. She hadn't meant to lose control like that, but the words had poured out of her like water from a broken dam. The driver said nothing for a long moment, and Evelyn feared she'd offended him beyond repair. Then, without taking his eyes off the road, he spoke. It's the first good rain we've had in weeks, miss, he said, his voice low and steady. Sorely needed it was. Might be ruining your hem, but it means the folks around here stand a chance of not starving. His words hit Evelyn like a physical blow. She felt her face grow hot with shame as the reality of her selfishness sank in. She glanced around as if seeing the fields dotted with tiny houses for the first time. Here she was, complaining about mud and discomfort, while the people around her were facing the very real threat of starvation. She'd never been confronted with true privation before. Of course, she knew that people were hungry in London. She wasn't naive. And of course, the infamous rookeries. However, she'd never had to confront true hunger and want before. Evelyn fell silent, chastened by the driver's words. She stared at her gloved hands, twisting in her lap as shame washed over her. After a moment, she gathered her courage and decided to change tack. I... I see, she said softly. Perhaps you could tell me what sort of master is the Baron. I confess I know little about him. The driver turned his head slightly. Surprise evident in his scarred profile. He chewed on his piece of straw, considering the question. Well now, he began, his voice thoughtful. The Baron, he's... He tries his best to be a fair man, that's certain. He paused, adjusting his grip on the reins. Looks after his tenants, does what he can to keep them from the poorhouse. Evelyn listened intently, grateful for any insight into her new employer. Course, the driver continued. Some might find him a bit rough around the edges. Not one for fancy words or manners, the Baron. But he's got a good heart, underneath it all. Evelyn pondered this information. A fair man with a good heart was certainly preferable to some of the alternatives she'd imagined during her journey. Still, the phrase rough around the edges gave her pause. What exactly did that mean? Before she could ask for clarification, the driver spoke again. He's had his share of troubles, the Baron has, but he does right by his people, and that's what matters most out here. Evelyn hesitated for a moment, then decided to press further. And how is the Baron to work for? I imagine you must have some insight, being in his employ. The driver tilted his head slightly, shifting the brim of the hat a little so that Evelyn caught a glimpse of a sharp profile. He chewed thoughtfully on his piece of straw before answering. I suppose you'd have to ask one of his servants. Evelyn's brow furrowed in confusion. I thought I did just ask one of his servants, she thought. Then it dawned on her. This man was likely just an outdoor staff member, someone dispatched to pick her up like she was a sack of grain for the horses. He wasn't the coachman at all. The revelation hit Evelyn like a splash of cold water. Her fingers tightened on the fabric of her skirts as a wave of indignation washed over her. The Baron couldn't even be bothered to send his proper coachman to collect her. Instead, he'd dispatched some common labourer to ferry her to her new position. She pressed her lips together, fighting to maintain her composure. It wouldn't do to unleash another tirade not when she'd just made a fool of herself moments ago. But the slight stung, adding to her growing list of grievances against her new employer. Evelyn turned her face away, staring out at the passing countryside without really seeing it. Her mind raced, conjuring images of the Baron as a neglectful, uncaring master who couldn't be bothered with the comfort or propriety of his staff. Was this how he treated all his employees? Or was she being singled out for such disregard? Chapter 4 The wagonette jolted over another rut in the road, 
jarring Evelyn from her brooding thoughts. She winced, her discomfort now compounded by her wounded pride. As they rattled on towards her uncertain future, Evelyn couldn't help but wonder what other unpleasant surprises awaited her at the Baron's estate. As they crested a small hill, the Baron's manor house suddenly came into view. Evelyn's eyes widened at the sight of the imposing structure, its grey stone walls rising up from the surrounding countryside. She straightened her spine, preparing herself for the first glimpse of her new home. It was grand enough, but the western wing of the house was blackened and burnt. The sight of it made Evelyn's eyes widen. To her surprise, the wagonette didn't veer towards the side of the house where she assumed the servant's entrance would be. Instead, it rolled to a stop directly in front of the grand front doors. Evelyn blinked in confusion, certain there must be some mistake. The driver leapt down from his seat with unexpected agility, landing lightly on his feet. He patted the horse's flank affectionately before moving to collect her trunk from the back of the wagonette. Evelyn remained perched on her seat, staring pointedly at the driver. She waited, expecting him to offer his hand to help her down as any proper servant would. But the man seemed oblivious to her expectation, focusing entirely on wrestling her trunk from the back of the vehicle. Frustration bubbled up inside her. Was she to be subjected to one indignity after another? First, the muddy journey in this rickety conveyance, and now she was expected to scramble down on her own like some common farm girl. Evelyn cleared her throat loudly, hoping to catch the driver's attention. He glanced up at her, his expression blank beneath the brim of his hat. She raised an eyebrow, silently willing him to understand his duty. Still, he made no move to assist her. Evelyn's cheeks flushed with a mixture of embarrassment and anger. She was a lady, for heaven's sake. How dare this uncouth man leave her stranded atop this wretched wagonette? Evelyn's patience wore thin as she waited atop the wagonette. With a huff of exasperation, she gathered her skirts and began the precarious descent on her own. Her boots slipped on the muddy step, and she barely caught herself before tumbling ungracefully to the ground. Heart pounding, Evelyn smoothed her rumpled dress and glared at the driver's back. Was this some sort of test? A way to gauge her mettle before presenting her to her new employer? I don't suppose the Baron will be greeting me himself, she asked, unable to keep the sarcasm from her voice. Or am I to wander the halls until I stumble upon him by chance? The driver paused in his efforts with her trunk, straightening slowly. For the first time, he lifted his chin, allowing Evelyn a clear view of his face. The scar she'd glimpsed earlier ran from his temple to his jaw, lending a fierce cast to his otherwise handsome features. His grey eyes met hers, sharp and penetrating. As a matter of fact, Miss Bain, he said, voice still gruff and unyielding, the Baron has already met you. Confusion clouded Evelyn's features as she tried to make sense of it. I beg your pardon? Something unreadable passed over his eyes. I am James Ailes, Baron Hastings. Welcome to the estate, he added as an afterthought. Evelyn felt the blood drain from her face as the full impact of his words hit her. She refused to be cowed, though. She'd endured too much over the past year to let a simple embarrassment end her now. She tossed her head proudly, daringly meeting the Baron's eyes. Evelyn watched, her mouth slightly agape, as the Baron effortlessly hoisted her trunk onto his broad shoulder. The mud caking the bottom of it seemed not to bother him in the slightest. Despite her best efforts to maintain her composure, she couldn't help but feel a flicker of admiration for his raw strength and physicality. Shaking herself from her momentary reverie, Evelyn gathered her wits and hurried after him as he strode towards the house. She had to quicken her pace to keep up with his long strides. My lord, she called, slightly breathless. Where are the footmen? Surely it's not proper for you to be carrying my trunk yourself. The baron didn't slow his pace, but he did turn his head slightly to address her. All hands are needed for the spring planting. It can't wait, not with the weather we've had. Evelyn's eyes flickered with confusion, her brows drawing together at this. 
It seemed utterly bizarre for a baron to be doing manual labour, let alone concerning himself with the minutiae of farming. She opened her mouth to question this further, but thought better of it. As they neared the entrance, a new concern struck her. She hesitated, glancing back at the wagonette. But what about the horse? she asked. Won't it wander off if left unattended? The baron paused at the foot of the steps, turning to face her fully. His grey eyes met hers, a hint of amusement flickering in their depths. No, he replied simply, before turning and continuing up the stairs. Evelyn stood for a moment, stunned by the brevity of his response. She looked back at the horse, which indeed seemed content to stand exactly where it had been left, then hurried to catch up with the baron once more. Evelyn followed the baron up the grand staircase, her bewilderment growing with each step. This was not at all how she'd imagined being shown to her quarters. The opulent surroundings seemed at odds with the mud-splattered man leading the way, her trunk still balanced effortlessly on his shoulder. They passed several ornate doors before reaching the far end of the house. Evelyn's eyes widened as she realised they were approaching the blackened wing she'd spotted from outside. The Baron pushed open a door just shy of the charred section, revealing a modestly furnished room. Without ceremony, he deposited her trunk on the floor with a solid thud. Evelyn opened her mouth to speak, but before she could utter a word, the Baron turned on his heel, clearly intending to leave without further ado. He paused at the threshold, as if suddenly remembering something important. Slowly he turned back to face her, his hand moving to the brim of his hat. Evelyn held her breath, unsure of what to expect. As he removed his hat, Evelyn felt her heart skip a beat. The left side of his face was indeed handsome, with chiselled features that wouldn't have looked out of place on a classical statue. But the right side? A web of angry scars stretched from his temple to his jaw, evidence of a horrific burn. Evelyn stood perfectly still, willing herself not to react. She met his gaze steadily, refusing to look away or show any sign of discomfort. The Baron's grey eyes studied her intently, searching for any hint of revulsion or pity. Finding none, he inclined his head in a small bow. Without a word he turned and strode from the room, leaving Evelyn alone with her thoughts and the echo of his retreating footsteps. Evelyn sank onto the narrow brass bed her body finally giving in to the exhaustion that had been building throughout the day. The mattress creaked beneath her weight, a far cry from the plush comfort she'd grown accustomed to in London. She stared up at the ceiling, her mind whirling with the events of the past few hours. What on earth have I gotten myself into? She thought as she stared up at the plain white ceiling. Chapter 5 James Ailes Baron Hastings shook his head as he strode away from Miss Bain. The woman's incessant chatter and obvious disdain for country life grated on his nerves. He'd hoped for someone more practical, someone who understood the gravity of the situation facing his estate and his daughters. He descended the stairs, his mind already shifting to the pressing matters at hand. The spring planting was far behind schedule, and if they didn't make significant progress soon, his tenants would face a grim winter. The thought of families going hungry under his care twisted his gut. James pushed open the heavy oak door and stepped out into the weak spring sunshine. The air was thick with the scent of freshly turned earth and the faint tang of desperation. He could see figures dotting the fields bent low over their work. His footmen were out there too, their fine livery exchanged for rough work clothes. He strode towards the nearest field, his long legs eating up the distance. As he approached, he recognised young Thomas, a footman barely out of boyhood, struggling with a hoe. The lad's face was red with exertion, his hands already blistering. Here, lad, James said gruffly, holding out his hand. Let me show you. Thomas looked up, startled. My lord, I... None of that now, James cut him off, taking the hoe. Watch. With practised movements, James demonstrated the proper technique, his muscles remembering the motions from years past. 
He'd worked these fields alongside his father, learning the rhythms of the land long before he'd inherited the title. See? he said, handing the tool back. Long, steady strokes. You'll tire less quickly that way. Keep the furrows sharp. Thomas nodded, a look of determination settling over his young face. Thank you, my lord. James clapped him on the shoulder and moved on, his eyes scanning the fields. In the distance, he could see other footmen distributing water to the workers, their usual crisp movements slowed by the unfamiliar terrain. James scanned the field, his eyes catching on a familiar figure. Nell, one of his most reliable servants, was bent over a row of seedlings, her movements deft and sure. Her wide-brimmed hat, secured by a kerchief, cast a shadow over her face, but he could still see the healthy flush of her cheeks from the sun and honest work. Nell, he called out, his voice carrying across the freshly tilled earth. She straightened immediately, her face breaking into a warm smile as she spotted him. With a quick brush of her hands against her apron, she hurried towards him, her steps light despite the long hours of labour. My lord, she said, dipping into a quick curtsy as she reached him. How may I be of service? James felt a small knot of tension in his chest, ease at her eagerness. Here was someone he could rely on, someone who understood the importance of hard work and duty. The new governess has arrived, he said, his tone gruff but not unkind. Could you see to getting her settled in? I fear she's... He paused as he considered. Not used to seeing a speck of mud out of place. Nell's eyes sparkled with amusement, but she quickly schooled her features. Of course, my lord. I'll see to it immediately. The poor dear must be quite overwhelmed. James nodded, grateful for her understanding. Thank you, Nell. Your help is appreciated, as always. With another quick curtsy, Nell turned and hurried back towards the house, her steps purposeful and her back straight. James watched her go, a small frown creasing his brow. He hoped the new governess would adapt quickly to life at the estate. They needed all hands working together if they were to weather the challenges ahead. As James stood in the warm spring sun, he grudgingly considered Miss Bain. The woman hadn't fled at the first sight of mud on her skirts, which was more than he'd expected given her obvious discomfort with country life. He recalled the journey from the coach station, his lips quirking into a wry smile. Miss Bain had chattered incessantly, her crisp London accent pointing out every perceived flaw in the countryside. Yet beneath her complaints, he'd sensed a steely determination. She'd held her head high, even as the rough road jostled her about. James had stolen glances at her profile as he drove, curiosity getting the better of him. Her dark eyes had flashed with temper and spirit, a stark contrast to the demure governesses he'd interviewed in the past. There was something refreshing about her directness, even if it bordered on impropriety. He turned away from the field, running a hand through his hair. Perhaps he'd been too hasty in his judgment. Miss Bain might be out of her element, but she hadn't given up at the first hurdle. That, at least, boded well for her ability to handle his spirited daughters. The sun was beginning to beat down in earnest, and James reached up to swipe at his brow, thoughts still lingering on Miss Bain. Despite her initial shock at his appearance, she hadn't recoiled from him. It was a small mercy, but one he appreciated nonetheless. He'd seen far too many faces twist in horror at the sight of his scars. He'd agreed to take her on a trial basis, and James was not a man to go back on his word. Besides, sending her away now would only delay the inevitable. His daughters needed a governess, and Miss Bain was here, ready to begin. A movement in the distance caught his eye. Jamie's looked up to see Farmer Gilles approaching, accompanied by him and carrying what appeared to be large rolled papers under his arm. The sight made James sigh inwardly. He recognised the man as Mr Wilkins, the surveyor he'd hired to assess the possibility of improving the estate's irrigation system. James squared his shoulders, pushing thoughts of Miss Bain and household matters aside. He couldn't afford such distractions now, not when the very future of his estate hung in the balance. The farmers needed his full attention if they were to weather this crisis, 
He strode forward to meet them, his face settling into the stern mask he wore like armour. As he stepped out to meet Farmer Giles and Mr Wilkins, James silently hoped Miss Bain would prove capable of managing on her own for now. The estate's problems couldn't wait. James winced as Mr Wilkins pumped his hand with enthusiasm, the man's grip surprisingly strong for one who spent his days poring over maps and figures. My lord, I cannot express how thrilled I am to present our findings, Mr Wilkins gushed, his eyes alight with excitement. We've discovered opportunities that could revolutionise your estate's productivity. James extricated his hand, nodding politely. Indeed? Well, let's hear it then. Mr Wilkins unfurled his maps with a flourish, spreading them across a nearby wooden table. James leaned in, his brow furrowing as he studied the intricate lines and notations. As you can see, my lord, we've mapped out a comprehensive irrigation system that would significantly improve water distribution across your fields, Mr Wilkins explained, his finger tracing the proposed channels. But that's not all. We've learned that your neighbours to the east are planning a shipping canal. If we act quickly, we could connect to it, opening up new trade routes for your estate's produce. James felt a twinge of unease. The idea was bold, certainly, but the scale of disruption to his tenants' lives. He glanced at Farmer Giles, noting the older man's furrowed brow. It's an intriguing proposal, James said carefully, straightening up. I'll need time to consider the implications. Mr Wilkins' face fell slightly, but he nodded. Of course, my lord. But I urge you not to delay too long. This opportunity won't last forever. James clasped his hands behind his back, his mind already racing through the potential consequences. The canal could indeed bring prosperity. But at what cost? He thought of the families who had worked this land for generations, their lives intertwined with the rhythms of the estate. I appreciate your thoroughness, Mr Wilkins, James said. I'll review your plans in detail and consult with my tenants. We'll reconvene once I've had time to weigh all factors. As Mr Wilkins gathered his maps, James turned to Farmer Giles. The old man's weathered face was etched with concern. What do you think, Giles? James asked quietly. Giles scratched his chin. It's a big change, my lord. Might bring good, might bring trouble. Folk around here, they don't take to change easy. James nodded, feeling the weight of responsibility settle heavily on his shoulders. He would need to tread carefully, balancing progress with tradition, the needs of the estate with the lives of those who called it home. James turned instinctively towards the manor house, its stone walls rising in the distance. His gaze softened as his thoughts drifted to his daughters. They were still young, their laughter echoing through the halls, their mischief keeping the household on its toes. But time was relentless, and soon they would be grown women, in need of security and independence. The weight of responsibility settled more firmly on his shoulders. He wanted, no, needed, to leave them a legacy they could be proud of, an estate that would provide for them long after he was gone. The thought filled him with renewed determination, stealing his resolve. James squared his shoulders and turned back to Mr Wilkins, who was still hovering nearby, hope etched on his eager face. Mr Wilkins, James said, his voice firm with decision. I'll need more information before I can make a final choice. Present me with detailed facts and figures. I want to know exactly how much we could ship and what prices we might fetch in better markets. Leave no stone unturned in your analysis. Mr Wilkins's eyes lit up and he nodded vigorously. Of course, my lord. I'll have a comprehensive report on your desk within the fortnight. You won't be disappointed, I assure you. As the surveyor hurried off, practically tripping over his own feet in his excitement, James allowed himself a small smile. The man's enthusiasm was infectious, even if his ideas were daunting. James cast one last glance at the manor house, thoughts of his daughters spurring him on. Whatever changes might come, he would face them head on for their sake. After all, everything he did was for them.
they were all that he had left. James blinked, realising Farmer Giles had asked him a question. He shook his head, embarrassed at his momentary lapse in attention. I beg your pardon, Giles. My mind wandered for a moment. What were you saying? The old farmer's weathered face creased with understanding. No worries, my lord. I was just asking about the new seed we tried in the south field. Reckon it's time to check on its progress. James nodded, grateful for the farmer's patience. Yes, indeed, let's head there now. As they walked, James tried to focus on Giles' words about crop rotation and soil quality. But his thoughts kept drifting back to his daughters, to the sound of their laughter echoing through the manor's halls. Unbidden, the memory of smoke filled his nostrils, acrid and choking. James clenched his fists, fighting back the familiar wave of panic that threatened to overwhelm him. He could almost hear the crackle of flames, feel the searing heat on his skin. My lord, you all right there? Giles's concerned voice cut through the haze of memory. James realised he had stopped walking, his breath coming in short, sharp gasps. I'm fine, Giles, he managed, forcing a smile that felt more like a grimace. Just remembering something. The old farmer's eyes softened with sympathy. He didn't pry, for which James was grateful. Instead, Giles pointed to a nearby field where green shoots were just beginning to push through the soil. Look there, my lord. That new wheat's coming up strong. James latched onto the change of subject, grateful for the distraction. He strode towards the field, focusing on the task at hand. Yet even as he bent to examine the tender shoots, part of his mind remained on high alert. It was as if listening for the distant sound of his daughter's cries. The lingering scent of smoke seemed to follow him, a ghostly reminder of all he had lost and all he still feared to lose. Growing strong, James said, running his hand over the tiny green shoots. James straightened, brushing soil from his hands as he considered Giles's words. Perhaps having Miss Bain in the house wasn't such a terrible notion after all. Another set of watchful eyes could prove useful, especially with his daughter's penchant for mischief. I, my lord, Giles continued, a sly grin creeping across his weathered face. Speaking of new arrivals, I hear there's a fresh face up at the manor, a new governess, is it? James nodded, his expression neutral. Indeed. Miss Bain arrived just this afternoon. Giles chuckled, his eyes twinkling. A comely lass, is she? The young lads about the estate will be right pleased to have another pretty face to admire, I'd wager. James opened his mouth to dismiss the notion, but found himself pausing. He hadn't really considered Miss Bain in those terms. His mind drifted back to their first encounter, recalling her appearance with a newfound awareness. Dark eyes, flashing with spirit and indignation, chestnut curls that seemed barely contained beneath her bonnet, skin so pale it seemed to glow in the afternoon sun, a stark contrast to the muddy lane they'd travelled. I suppose, James conceded reluctantly, the young men might find her pleasing to look upon. She's certainly striking. Giles's grin widened, but James quickly added, Not that it matters. She's here to educate my daughters, not to catch the eye of every farmhand and stable boy. Despite his stern words, James found his thoughts lingering on Miss Bain's appearance. He shook his head annoyed at himself for such frivolous musings. There were far more pressing matters at hand than the new governess's looks. James turned away from Giles, pretending not to notice the knowing look in the old farmer's eyes. He focused intently on the young wheat shoots, running his fingers over their delicate stalks again, testing to see how they sprang back. We should check the drainage in the lower field, he said gruffly, desperate to change the subject. With all this rain on the dry soil, I worry about flooding. But even as he spoke, James found his thoughts drifting. Miss Bain's face swam before his mind's eye, unbidden and unwelcome. He saw again those dark eyes wide and startled like a doze when she'd realised who he was.
The memory of her indignation, the flush of colour in her cheeks, stirred something in him he thought long dead. James clenched his jaw, irritated by his own foolishness. He'd locked away such thoughts years ago after the fire. His heart was not his to give. It belonged to his daughters and to the estate. There was no room for pretty governesses with flashing eyes and sharp tongues. And yet... He shook his head forcefully, as if to dislodge the image of Miss Bain from his mind. It was ridiculous, this fixation. She was here to teach his girls nothing more. He had no business thinking of her in any other capacity. My lord? Giles's voice cut through his reverie. Are you quite all right? James realised he'd been standing still, staring blankly at the wheat field. He cleared his throat, embarrassed by his lapse. Perfectly fine, Giles, he said his voice perhaps a touch too stern. Now, about that drainage issue. As they walked towards the lower field, James silently berated himself. He was the Baron of Hastings, not some lovesick youth. He had responsibilities, duties that required his full attention. He couldn't afford to be distracted by a pair of dark eyes, no matter how bewitching they might be. Chapter 6 Evelyn knelt before the empty grate, her fingers hovering uncertainly over the unfamiliar iron tools. The chill of her journey still clung to her bones, seeping through her travelling dress despite the relative warmth of the day outside. She had never built a fire before, always relying on servants to tend to such matters. Now faced with the prospect of warming herself, she felt woefully unprepared. She picked up the poker, its weight foreign in her hand. How did one even begin? Surely there must be kindling of some sort. Her gaze darted around the sparse room, seeking anything that might serve. A stack of newspapers caught her eye, tucked neatly beside the fireplace. Well, she murmured to herself, I suppose that's a start. Evelyn reached for the papers, her movements hesitant. She crumpled one sheet, then another arranging them in what she hoped was a suitable formation within the grate. The iron tools clinked together as she fumbled with them, the sound seeming to mock her inexperience. Now for the wood, she said, eyeing the small stack beside the hearth. She selected a few pieces, trying to recall how she had seen fires laid in the past. As she placed them atop the paper, doubt crept in. Was this correct? Would it even catch? A sharp knock at the door startled her, nearly causing her to drop a log on her foot. Evelyn straightened, brushing her hands against her skirts as she rose. Yes, she called, her voice betraying a hint of relief at the interruption. It's Nell, miss, a voice called through the door. His lordship thought I might help get you settled. Evelyn felt a wave of relief wash over her. Please, do come in, she called smoothing her skirts and willing the colour in her cheeks to fade. The door creaked open, and Nell stepped inside. Her warm smile immediately put Evelyn at ease, dispelling some of the tension that had built up since her arrival. Welcome to Aylesbury Manor, Miss Bain, Nell said, dipping into a small curtsy. I hope your journey wasn't too taxing. Evelyn couldn't help but notice how pretty the maid was, in a rural sort of way. Her flax blonde hair was neatly tucked beneath her cap, and her dark blue eyes sparkled with a hint of mischief. It was eventful, Evelyn replied, her mind flashing back to the uncomfortable ride with the Baron. She pushed the thought aside, focusing on the present. I'm grateful for your assistance. Nell's gaze drifted to the fireplace, and Evelyn felt a fresh wave of embarrassment. The maid's lips twitched, but she maintained her composure. You must be worn out from your travels, miss, Nell said kindly. Why don't you have a seat? I'll tend to the fire for you. Evelyn hesitated, torn between relief and a desire to prove herself capable. I wouldn't want to impose... Nonsense, Nell interrupted, already moving towards the hearth. It's my job, after all. And between you and me, miss, I've had plenty of practice. As Nell set about arranging the kindling and logs, Evelyn sank into a nearby chair, 
watching with a mixture of curiosity and admiration. The maid's movements were swift and sure, her hands deftly manipulating the tools that had seemed so foreign to Evelyn moments ago. There we are, Nell said, striking a match and touching it to the paper. The flame caught quickly, licking up the kindling and spreading to the logs. It'll be nice and warm in here in no time. Thank you, Evelyn murmured, genuinely grateful. I'm afraid I'm not terribly accustomed to, well, to much of anything here, it seems. Nell turned, her expression softening. Don't you worry, miss. We'll have you settled in before you know it. Evelyn watched as Nell moved easily towards the trunk at the foot of the bed. The maid's efficiency was a stark reminder of Evelyn's own inexperience, and she felt a twinge of unease settle in her stomach. Shall I help you unpack, Miss Bain? Nell asked, her fingers already working at the clasps. That would be most kind, Evelyn replied, rising from her chair. She hesitated, unsure whether to assist or simply observe. As Nell began to remove Evelyn's carefully folded gowns, she glanced up with a curious expression. If you don't mind me asking, miss, did you come from a large household? With many servants, I mean. Evelyn's breath caught for a moment. She had never outright lied about her circumstances, but neither had she been entirely forthcoming. Yes, she said carefully. I did. Quite a large household, in fact. It wasn't untrue, she reasoned. Aunt Agnes's home had been sizable, with a full complement of staff, and the judge's household before that had been ostentatiously grand. The fact that Evelyn had been raised in such circumstances need not be mentioned. Nell nodded slowly, her brow furrowing slightly as she continued to unpack. That explains it then, she said, more to herself than to Evelyn. Explains what? Evelyn asked, curiosity overriding her caution. Nell looked up, a faint blush colouring her cheeks. Oh, I didn't mean... It's just... Well, it explains why a governess wouldn't know how to tend a fire, is all. Evelyn felt her own face grow warm. I suppose it does, she admitted, forcing a small laugh. I'm afraid I'm rather useless when it comes to practical matters. To her surprise, Nell's expression softened. Don't worry yourself about it, miss. We all have to start somewhere. Evelyn found herself relaxing slightly. You're very kind she said. I must admit I'm a little jealous of your practical knowledge. I do hope I'll gain some of my own soon. Nell's smile brightened as she continued to help Evelyn unpack. Her deft hands moved swiftly, removing each garment with care and laying it out on the bed. As she lifted a pale blue dress with pleated trim at the hem and delicate lace at the neckline, her eyes widened in admiration. Oh, Miss Bain! Nell breathed, her fingers tracing the intricate lacework. This is beautiful. Your last mistress must have been very generous indeed. Evelyn felt a pang of guilt at the maid's words. Thoughts of Aunt Agnes flashed through her mind. The woman who had taken her in, treated her as family, and insisted on a new wardrobe for her new life away from the judge. It wasn't entirely a lie to agree, was it? Yes. Evelyn said softly, pushing aside her discomfort. She was very kind to me. Nell held the dress up against Evelyn's face, her eyes sparkling with approval. This colour suits you perfectly, miss. It brings out your eyes. She paused, a mischievous grin playing at her lips. I'd wager you left a string of broken hearts behind you in London. Evelyn couldn't help but laugh at the notion. If only Nell knew how close to the truth that was. I'm afraid not, she replied, shaking her head. My life has been rather... sheltered. As Nell continued to unpack, chattering away about the manor and its inhabitants, Evelyn felt warming to the young maid. There was something refreshingly genuine about her, a warmth that cut through the uncertainty and fear that had plagued Evelyn since her arrival. For the first time since setting foot in Aylesbury Manor, Evelyn felt a glimmer of hope. Perhaps she wasn't entirely alone in this strange new world. Perhaps in Nell, she might find a friend.
Evelyn watched as Nell continued to unpack, her movements efficient and practised. The maid's hands paused as she lifted another gown, her brow furrowing slightly as she glanced back at Evelyn. Oh, Miss Bain, Nell exclaimed, a hint of embarrassment colouring her cheeks. I'm terribly sorry. You're still in your travelling dress. Would you like some help changing? Evelyn hesitated, suddenly aware of her rumpled appearance. I... perhaps I should, she murmured, then paused. A thought occurred to her and she bit her lip uncertainly. But shouldn't I greet my new charges first? I wouldn't want to be a complete surprise to them. To her surprise, Nell let out an unladylike snort. I'd wager they've already seen you, miss, even if you haven't seen them. Evelyn blinked, puzzled by the cryptic reply. She opened her mouth to ask what Nell meant, but the maid had already turned away, busying herself with explaining the household laundry system. The servants will collect your clothes for washing, Nell said, her voice muffled as she bent to retrieve a stray stocking. You needn't worry about that. Evelyn's curiosity about Nell's earlier comment gnawed at her, but she found no opportunity to ask as the maid continued her efficient unpacking. Instead, she watched as Nell's gaze lingered once more on the pale blue dress, a wistful expression crossing her face. If I may say so, miss, Nell said softly, her fingers ghosting over the delicate lace. You might not want to trust the servants with such fine work. It's... Well, it's not something we see often here. Evelyn felt a pang of sympathy for the young maid. It is rather lovely, isn't it? She said gently. Nell nodded, her eyes still fixed on the dress. I hope one day I'll have a dress so beautiful, she murmured, almost to herself. Then, as if remembering her place, she straightened and offered Evelyn a bright smile. Now then, miss, shall we get you changed? Evelyn stood still as Nell's nimble fingers worked at the fastenings of her travelling dress. The fabric, stiff with dried mud, clung stubbornly to her skin. She felt a twinge of embarrassment at her dishevelled state, but Nell's cheerful chatter put her somewhat at ease. There we are, miss, Nell said, easing the dress over Evelyn's shoulders. Let's get you into something more comfortable. The tea gown Nell selected was a soft, dove-grey light wool that whispered against Evelyn's skin as she slipped it on. The warmth from the crackling fire began to seep into her bones, chasing away the last of the chill from her journey. I'll have one of the kitchen maids bring up a tray for you later, Nell promised, smoothing the gown's folds. You must be famished after your travels. Evelyn nodded gratefully, sinking into a chair by the fire. As Nell turned to leave, a question that had been nagging at Evelyn's mind since her arrival bubbled to the surface. Nell, she called softly, causing the maid to pause at the door. I was wondering. How close are we to the burnt-out West Wing and all of that? Nell's expression softened. Oh, you needn't worry about that, miss. The house is as sturdy as a fortress. You're quite safe here. Evelyn hesitated, then lowered her voice. What? What happened there? For the first time since their meeting, Nell's face went blank, her usual warmth replaced by a hardness that startled Evelyn. We don't talk about that, miss, Nell said, her tone clipped. Evelyn felt her cheeks burn with embarrassment. She looked down at her hands, twisting in her lap. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to pry. As quickly as it had appeared, the hardness vanished from Nell's face, replaced once more by her cheerful demeanour. No harm done, miss. Why don't you get some rest? I'll be back with your food later. With that, Nell slipped out of the room, leaving Evelyn alone with her thoughts and the crackling fire. There was something ghoulish about it, sitting and taking such comfort from a fire when part of her new home lay in ruins from a fire just a few steps away. The Baron sat hunched over his desk, the flickering candlelight casting long shadows across the study. His eyes strained to make out the figures in the ledger before him, the rows of numbers blurring into an indecipherable mess.
he pinched the bridge of his nose, trying to ward off the headache that threatened to overtake him. The agricultural reports were grim. The new methods he'd been pushing hadn't taken hold as quickly as he'd hoped, and now his tenants faced the very real possibility of a lean harvest. James felt the weight of their livelihoods pressing down upon his shoulders, a burden he'd never asked for but couldn't bring himself to shirk. His mind drifted to the tense dinner he'd endured earlier. The girls had barely touched their food, their faces set in stubborn scowls that spoke volumes about their feelings towards the new governess. James had tried to engage them in conversation, but his efforts had been met with sullen silence or monosyllabic responses. He sighed, running a hand through his unkempt hair. The arrival of Miss Bain had stirred up a hornet's nest, and he wasn't entirely sure he had the energy to deal with the fallout. Her incessant chatter during the drive from the coach station still rang in his ears, a stark contrast to the quiet solitude he'd grown accustomed to. A sharp knock at the study door startled him from his reverie. James straightened in his chair, his shoulders tensing instinctively. Come in, he called, his voice rough from disuse. The door creaked open and James found himself hoping it wasn't Miss Bain. He wasn't prepared to face another barrage of questions or complaints about country life. Not tonight, when his patience was already worn thin. James looked up as Nell entered the study, her familiar presence a welcome respite from his troubled thoughts. She hesitated at the threshold, her usual confidence replaced by an uncharacteristic nervousness. Begging your pardon, my lord. I didn't mean to disturb you, Nell said, her eyes darting to the scattered papers on his desk. You look exhausted. Perhaps we could speak tomorrow instead. James waved away her concern, gesturing for her to approach. Nonsense, Nell. You're here now. What's on your mind? Nell stepped closer, wringing her hands. James frowned, unaccustomed to seeing her so ill at ease. She'd been a steady presence in the household for years, her cheerful demeanour a balm to his own melancholy. To see her troubled now only added to his unease. Well, sir, it's about Miss Bain, Nell began, her voice lowered as if afraid the very walls might overhear. I know she's only just arrived, and I don't want to speak out of turn. James leaned back in his chair, a weariness settling over him that had nothing to do with the late hour. Go on, he prompted, bracing himself for whatever fresh complication the new governess had introduced to his already chaotic household. Nell took a deep breath, her resolve visibly strengthening. It's just... I'm concerned about how she'll fit in here, my lord. She seems rather unsuited to country life. James couldn't help but let out a dry chuckle. That much was evident from the moment she stepped off the coach, Nell. But surely it's too soon to judge. Perhaps, sir, Nell conceded, though her furrowed brow suggested she wasn't entirely convinced. But I fear her... Unfamiliarity with our ways might cause more upheaval than the girls can handle. They've been through so much already. James felt a pang of guilt at the mention of his daughters. He'd been so consumed with the estate's troubles that he'd barely given thought to how they might be adjusting to Miss Bain's presence. He rubbed his temples, trying to ward off the headache that threatened to overwhelm him. What exactly has Miss Bain done to worry you so, Nell? he asked dreading the answer. James felt his muscles tense as he waited for Nell's response. The maid's hesitation only heightened his concern. Well, my lord, Nell began, her voice barely above a whisper, I showed Miss Bain to her room earlier, and I noticed she seemed unfamiliar with the hearth. James leaned forward, his brow furrowing. Unfamiliar? How so? Nell wrung her hands, clearly uncomfortable with what she was about to say. She didn't seem to know how to light a fire, sir, or how to tend one safely. James's blood ran cold. He stood abruptly, his chair scraping against the wooden floor, the memory of flames licking at the walls of his home, the acrid smell of smoke, the screams. He shook his head, forcing the memories away. Are you certain, Nell? He asked, his voice hoarse. 
Nell nodded solemnly. I am, my lord. I wouldn't have mentioned it if I wasn't sure. I know how important fire safety is to you, to all of us. James paced behind his desk, his mind racing. The entire household knew the strict protocols in place regarding fire safety. It wasn't just a matter of practicality, it was a matter of survival. The thought of someone so careless with fire being responsible for his daughters sent a chill down his spine. Thank you for bringing this to my attention, Nell, he said, his voice tight with suppressed emotion. I'll speak with Miss Bain first thing in the morning. We can't afford to take any risks, not with... He trailed off, unable to finish the sentence. Nell's eyes softened with understanding. Of course, my lord. Is there anything else you need? James shook his head, suddenly feeling every bit of his thirty-five years. No, thank you, Nell. You may go. As the door closed behind her, James sank back into his chair, his head in his hands. The arrival of Miss Bain had already complicated matters more than he'd anticipated. Now, with this new information, he found himself questioning whether he'd made a grave mistake in bringing her to Hastings Manor. Chapter 7 Evelyn stood before the looking-glass, her fingers nervously smoothing down the front of her plain grey dress. The fabric felt coarse beneath her touch, a far cry from the silks and muslins she'd once worn. She tilted her head, examining the neat braids at her temples that led into a simple chignon at the nape of her neck. It was a style that spoke of practicality rather than fashion, but she hoped it would strike the right balance between respectability and approachability. Her reflection stared back at her, pale and wide-eyed. Evelyn took a deep breath, willing her racing heart to slow. The enormity of what lay ahead threatened to overwhelm her. These girls, strangers to her, would now be her charges. Their education, their comportment, their very futures would rest in her hands. You can do this, she whispered to her reflection. You must. The looking-glass offered no reassurance. Evelyn's gaze drifted to the small hearth in her room, a reminder of her near disaster the night before. Heat crept up her neck at the memory of fumbling with the fire irons, grateful that the maid had shown her the basics. It was but one of many skills she'd need to master if she were to maintain this charade. Evelyn squared her shoulders, lifting her chin. She may not have been born to this life of service, but she'd be damned if she'd let that stop her from excelling at it. With one final glance at her reflection, she turned towards the door. Her hand hesitated on the latch. Beyond lay a world utterly foreign to her, a world of early mornings and hard work, of children's laughter and lessons. A world where she was no longer Lady Evelyn, but simply Miss Bain, the governess. Forward, she murmured, echoing her father's favourite command. Always forward. Evelyn descended the grand staircase, her hand gliding along the polished banister. Each step felt like a descent into the unknown, her stomach fluttering with a mixture of anticipation and dread. The house was deathly silent, almost tomb-like. As she approached the drawing room, Evelyn paused to smooth her dress one final time. She took a deep breath, steeling herself for the encounter that would shape her future. With a trembling hand, she reached for the door handle. The moment the door swung open, chaos erupted. Two enormous dogs bounded towards her in a chaotic tumble of shaggy grey fur, their paws scrabbling against the polished wooden floor. Before Evelyn could react, she found herself engulfed in a whirlwind of fur and slobber. Oh! she squeaked, stumbling backward against the wall as the enthusiastic beasts vied for her attention. Their rough tongues lapped at her face and hands, leaving trails of warm saliva in their wake. Evelyn's carefully arranged hair came loose, wisps falling about her face as she tried to fend off the overzealous greeting. Evelyn's heart raced as she heard muffled giggling from within the drawing room. Her cheeks burned with embarrassment, but a spark of indignation flared in her chest. This was no accident. It was a test, and one she refused to fail. Gathering what remained of her dignity, Evelyn pushed herself away from the wall, 
She stood as tall as her petite frame would allow, fixing the enormous beasts with a stern glare. Down, she commanded, her voice ringing out with surprising authority. Leave off at once. To her astonishment, the dogs obeyed. Their tails drooped, and they circled each other, whining softly. Evelyn felt a pang of guilt at their crestfallen expressions, but she pushed the feeling aside. She was here to be a governess, not to coddle overgrown puppies. With trembling hands, Evelyn attempted to smooth her hair back into place. She dabbed at her face with her handkerchief, grimacing at the traces of dog saliva. Her neat grey dress was now adorned with paw prints and tufts of grey fur. She'd never encountered dogs of such immense size before, let alone been accosted by them. The largest dog she'd ever seen had been her cousin's pampered spaniel, a far cry from these shaggy behemoths. Taking a deep breath, Evelyn straightened her spine and lifted her chin. She may look a fright, but she would face whatever lay beyond that door with all the poise she could muster. Her expression was hard and would have parted a sea by the time she regained the doorway to the drawing room. Evelyn stepped into the drawing room, her eyes immediately falling upon two young girls who stood side by side, their faces a picture of feigned innocence. Despite their best efforts, the mischievous glint in their eyes betrayed them. Miss Augusta and Miss Julia, I presume, Evelyn asked dryly, arching an eyebrow at the pair. The girls exchanged a quick glance, their lips twitching as they fought to suppress their smiles. Evelyn opened her mouth to address them further, but the sound of heavy-booted footsteps echoing through the house made her pause. The sisters' eyes widened in unison. Ah, oh, they muttered, their earlier bravado evaporating in an instant. They moved as one, attempting to sidle past Evelyn towards the door. Evelyn, however, was quicker. She shifted her stance, effectively blocking their escape. Her expression hardened into a dour look that brooked no argument. The girls froze, caught between their new governess and the approaching storm. The footsteps grew louder, more insistent. Evelyn's heart quickened, but she kept her face impassive. She would not show weakness, not now. The Baron marched into view, his face like thunder. He came to an abrupt halt, taking in the scene before him. Evelyn, dishevelled and covered in dog hair. His daughters, trapped and guilty. And the two enormous hounds who had the good sense to slink behind a chaise long. Evelyn met the Baron's stormy gaze, refusing to flinch under his scrutiny. She may have looked a fright, but she would not cower. Whatever came next, she was determined to face it with all the dignity she could muster, if one could be said to have dignity with a tuft of dog fur in one's hair like a courtier's ostrich plume. Evelyn watched it as the Baron's face darkened, his grey eyes stormy with anger. His gaze swept over his daughters, who seemed to shrink under his scrutiny. The girl's earlier mischief had vanished, replaced by a palpable tension that filled the room. Augusta and Julia stared resolutely at the floor, their shoulders hunched as if bracing for the impending reprimand. Evelyn felt a sudden, unexpected pang of sympathy for the pair. She remembered all too well the sting of disappointment from her own father, the weight of expectations that could crush a young spirit. Before she could second-guess herself, Evelyn stepped forward, plastering a bright smile on her face. She turned to the Baron, her voice light and airy. My lord, I must thank your daughters for their thoughtfulness, she said, ignoring the startled looks from both the girls and their father. They were kind enough to introduce me to your magnificent dogs. I've never had the pleasure of being around such fine animals before. A puzzled frown formed on the Baron's face, his gaze shifting from his daughters to Evelyn. She could see the confusion in his eyes, warring with the anger that still simmered beneath the surface. Evelyn pressed on, her smile unwavering. I must admit I was quite taken aback at first. But Miss Augusta and Miss Julia were most helpful in showing me how to properly greet such large dogs. It was quite the educational experience. She turned back to face the girls and quirked an eyebrow at them. Evelyn watched as understanding dawned on the girls' faces. They quickly caught on to her ruse, nodding enthusiastically. Oh yes, father, Augusta chimed in, her voice a touch too bright, 
We thought Miss Bain should meet Brutus and Caesar straight away. Julia nodded vigorously. We wanted to show her how friendly they are, didn't we, Augusta? The Baron's gaze flicked between his daughters and Evelyn, his expression still clouded with doubt. Evelyn could see the wheels turning in his mind, weighing the likelihood of this tale against his daughter's usual antics. Seizing the moment, Evelyn turned to face him fully, summoning every ounce of charm she possessed. She tilted her head slightly, allowing a few stray wisps of hair to frame her face, and gave him her most dazzling smile. It was a look that had once captivated half the ton, and she prayed it would work its magic now. The effect was immediate. The Baron's stern demeanour faltered, his eyes widening slightly as he took in her radiant expression. For a moment he seemed at a loss for words, his earlier anger dissipating like morning mist. Evelyn held his gaze, her heart hammering in her chest. She'd gambled everything on this moment, and now she waited, breath held, to see if it would pay off. Chapter 8 After what felt like an eternity, the Baron cleared his throat. Well, he said, his voice gruff but no longer thunderous. I suppose that's... thoughtful of you girls. He turned to his daughters, who were doing their best to look angelic. Take Brutus and Caesar back outside now. They've had quite enough excitement for one morning. The girls nodded quickly, relief evident on their faces. They scurried towards the chaise long, coaxing the two enormous dogs out from their hiding place. Come on, Brutus, Augusta called softly. Here, Caesar, Julia added, patting her leg. The dogs emerged, tails between their legs, looking as sheepish as their young mistresses. The motley procession shuffled towards the door, the girls shooting grateful glances at Evelyn as they passed. Evelyn watched as the girls and dogs disappeared from view, a small smile playing at her lips. She felt a sense of triumph, having navigated her first challenge as governess with unexpected grace. The girls' grateful glances hadn't escaped her notice, and she hoped this shared secret might form the foundation of a bond between them. Her satisfaction was short-lived, however, as she became acutely aware of the Baron's intense gaze upon her. Evelyn turned to face him, smoothing her rumpled dress as best she could. She lifted her chin, meeting his eyes with a mixture of deference and quiet confidence. Your daughters seem quite... spirited, my lord, she ventured, her tone carefully neutral. The Baron's expression remained inscrutable his grey eyes searching her face. He let her comment pass without acknowledgement, the silence stretching between them like a taut wire. Just as Evelyn began to feel her composure slipping, the Baron spoke. I'm glad to have this moment alone with you, Miss Bain. Evelyn's eyebrows rose involuntarily, surprise flickering across her features. She hadn't expected such a direct approach, especially not so soon after her arrival. A thousand possibilities raced through her mind, each more alarming than the last. Had he seen through her charade already? Was she to be dismissed before she'd even begun? She had only been taken on a trial basis after all, and could be summarily dismissed without notice. She swallowed hard, forcing her expression into one of polite inquiry. Indeed, my lord, she asked, her voice remarkably steady despite the nervous flutter in her chest. Evelyn felt her heart quicken as the Baron straightened, his imposing figure casting a shadow across the room. His grey eyes, usually so inscrutable, now bore into her with an intensity that made her want to shrink back. She steeled herself, refusing to show any outward sign of discomfort. Miss Bain, he began, his voice low and grave, I wish to address the matter of my daughter's education. Evelyn nodded relief washing over her. This at least was familiar territory. She had been thoroughly educated as a lady, and while she might not have experience as a governess, she certainly knew what was expected of young ladies of quality. Of course, my lord, she replied, her voice steady and assured. I assure you, I have every intention of moulding Miss Augusta and Miss Julia into accomplished young ladies.' 
By the time I've finished with them, they'll have their pick of suitors at every ball in London. Evelyn smiled, certain she had said exactly what any father would want to hear. She could already picture the girls, resplendent in silk gowns, dancing with handsome young men at Almax. It was the future she herself had once dreamed of, before, well, before everything had changed. To her surprise and dismay, the Baron's expression didn't soften at her words. Instead, his brow furrowed deeper, his jaw clenching visibly. The air in the room seemed to grow colder, and Evelyn felt a chill run down her spine. Miss Bain, the Baron said, his voice tight with barely suppressed emotion. I believe there has been a grave misunderstanding. Evelyn's smile faltered, confusion and a hint of fear creeping into her mind. She had been so certain she knew what he wanted to hear. What could she have possibly said wrong? Evelyn felt as though the ground had shifted beneath her feet. She stared at the Baron, certain she must have misheard him. His words echoed in her mind, each repetition more startling than the last. I... I beg your pardon, my lord, she managed, her voice barely above a whisper. The Baron's expression remained stern, but there was a flicker of something in his eyes. Determination, perhaps, or a hint of vulnerability. You heard me correctly, Miss Bain. I have no desire to see my daughters paraded about like prize mares at a county fair. Their worth is not measured by their ability to secure a wealthy husband. Evelyn's mind reeled. This was utterly unprecedented. In all her years in society, she had never encountered a father who didn't view his daughter's marriages as a matter of utmost importance. It went against everything she had been taught, everything she had believed about a woman's place in the world. And yet... As the initial shock began to fade, Evelyn felt a strange stirring in her chest. It was a feeling she couldn't quite name, a mixture of curiosity, excitement, and something that felt dangerously close to hope. You wish for them to be independent? she asked, carefully choosing her words. The Baron nodded, his gaze never leaving her face. I want them to be capable of standing on their own two feet, Miss Bain, to have minds of their own and the skills to support themselves should the need ever arise. Evelyn found herself nodding along, almost unconsciously. The idea was radical, even scandalous, but there was something undeniably appealing about it. She thought of her own situation, how different things might have been if she had been prepared for a life beyond the ballrooms and drawing rooms of London. I see, she said slowly, her mind racing with possibilities. I confess, this is not what I expected when I took the posting. Evelyn's mind whirled with the implications of the Baron's words. She opened her mouth to speak, but thinking better of it, fell into silent contemplation again. The Baron seemed to take her silence as hesitation. He nodded, a flicker of understanding crossing his face. I realise this is not what you expected, Miss Bain, he said, his voice softening slightly. He gestured towards the door with one arm. If this arrangement is unacceptable to you, you may leave without any stain on your character. I'll ensure you have a glowing reference for your next position. Evelyn's eyes widened. Leave? When things had suddenly become so intriguing. She held up a hand, surprising herself with her boldness. My lord, I'm not disagreeing with you, she said quickly. I'm merely... surprised. Your views are quite progressive. The Baron's eyebrows rose slightly, but he remained silent, waiting for her to continue. Evelyn took a deep breath, knowing she was about to overstep the bounds of propriety, but unable to contain her curiosity. If I may be so bold, she began, her heart racing. How will the young ladies live once you're... That is to say, ladies can't inherit titles. How will they manage? For a moment, Evelyn feared she had gone too far. The Baron's face remained impassive, and she braced herself for a stern rebuke. To her surprise, he merely nodded, as if he had been expecting this question. You're quite right, Miss Bain, he said. The title is entailed to a distant cousin.
However, I took steps long ago to separate the estate from the title. Evelyn's eyes widened as the implications of his words sank in. The Baron continued his voice matter-of-fact. My daughters will inherit the estate in its entirety. They will be very wealthy women, Miss Bain, with no need to rely on a husband for their security. Evelyn felt as though the world had tilted on its axis. Everything she had believed about a woman's place in society, about the importance of making a good match, suddenly seemed less certain. The idea was shocking, almost scandalous, and yet... intriguing. Evelyn turned away from the Baron, her gaze drifting to the ornate fireplace. Her mind wandered unbidden to darker times, to the suffocating confines of her marriage to the judge. The memories washed over her like a cold wave. The constant fear. The bruises hidden beneath long sleeves. The desperate struggle to break free from his iron grip. She remembered the night she had finally escaped. How she had run through the rain-slicked streets of London, her heart pounding in her chest. The terror of being caught, of being dragged back to that gilded cage, had haunted her for months afterwards. As these painful recollections swirled in her mind, a new realisation began to dawn. Augusta and Julia would never face such a fate. They would never be trapped never be forced to endure what she had. The Baron's unconventional approach to their upbringing would ensure they always had choices, always had the means to chart their own course in life. A smile began to spread across Evelyn's face, slow at first, then blossoming into something radiant and genuine. She turned back to face the Baron, allowing the full force of her joy to shine through. The effect on the Baron was immediate and striking. He blinked rapidly, clearly taken aback by the transformation in her countenance. For a moment he seemed at a loss for words, his usual stern demeanour cracking ever so slightly. My lord, Evelyn said, her voice warm and filled with newfound determination. I believe we shall get along quite well indeed. The Baron simply nodded, apparently still struggling to find his voice. He turned abruptly and made his way towards the door. As he reached the threshold, he paused, glancing out the window. Good luck, Miss Bain, he said gruffly, before disappearing into the hallway. Evelyn moved to the window, curiosity peaking as she wondered what had caught the Baron's attention. Outside, she spied Augusta and Julia, engaged in a boisterous game with Brutus and Caesar. The girls were laughing, their hair flying wildly as they tumbled about on the lawn, the enormous dogs bounding around them with joyful abandon. Despite her misgivings about the appropriateness of such behaviour, Evelyn couldn't help but laugh softly to herself. She was beginning to feel like there might be a place for her here after all. She gazed out at the girls thoughtfully. Though she approved of the Baron's demand for an unconventional education, Evelyn realised with a start that she hadn't the faintest clue as to what that actually meant. Evelyn watched the girls from the window, a small smile playing on her lips as she observed their carefree antics. The sight of Augusta and Julia romping with the dogs was a far cry from the prim and proper young ladies she had expected to find. There was something refreshing about their unbridled joy, even if it did fly in the face of societal expectations. Her musings were interrupted by the sound of hushed voices in the hallway. Curiosity peaked. Evelyn moved closer to the door, careful not to make a sound. She recognised the voices as belonging to some of the household staff. I give her a fortnight, Tops, one voice declared with a snicker. You saw how she looked when she arrived, all fancy frocks and airs. She'll be running back to London before the month's out. Nah, another voice chimed in. The young missus will see to her before then. Remember the last one? Didn't even make it a week before she was in tears. Evelyn felt her cheeks grow hot, indignation rising in her chest. She pressed her ear closer to the door, straining to catch every word. Well, I heard from Cook that the Baron himself doesn't think she'll last a week, a third voice added, barely containing her glee at sharing such juicy gossip. Said he'd never seen anyone less suited to country life? The servants' laughter echoed in the hallway, each guffaw stoking the fire of Evelyn's determination. She straightened her back, chin lifting defiantly. 
City princess indeed. She'd show them all what she was made of. As the servants' voices faded away, Evelyn turned back to the window, her gaze falling once more on Augusta and Julia. She watched as they tumbled about, their laughter carried on the breeze, and felt a fierce protectiveness wash over her. These girls needed her, whether they knew it yet or not, and she'd be damned if she'd let a few snide comments or country discomforts drive her away. Chapter 9 Evelyn surveyed the two girls before her, their hair windswept and cheeks flushed from their outdoor exertions. With some wrangling, she'd managed to herd them back indoors. She smoothed her own skirts, trying to project an air of calm authority she didn't quite feel. Well then, with the day's dosage of shenanigans out of the way, Evelyn said with an eyebrow arched significantly, perhaps we might try doing something a little more productive. Perhaps you might show me the schoolroom. Augusta, at least Evelyn assumed it was Augusta, the more serious of the pair, straightened her posture. We don't have a schoolroom, Miss Bain. Evelyn blinked, momentarily taken aback. Her gaze caught Augusta's eyes flicking towards what she assumed was the West Wing, but the girl's expression remained carefully neutral. Evelyn decided not to press the matter for now. I see, she said, her mind racing to adapt. In that case, Perhaps you'd be so kind as to show me your favourite room in the house? I'm still finding my bearings, you understand? Julia's face lit up. Oh, mine's the kitchen. Cook lets me lick the spoon when she makes pudding. Augusta shot her sister a quelling look. That's hardly proper, Julia. Evelyn hid a smile. I'm rather fond of sweets myself, she said, leaning in conspiratorially toward Julia. Still. Cook probably wouldn't appreciate us taking up so much space in her kitchen, would she? Let's have a bit of a look around, shall we? I'd love to see the parts of the house that are special to you. As they set off, Evelyn carefully observed the girls' interactions. Augusta moved with a quiet grace, while Julia practically bounced along beside her. Though their faces were identical, the contrast between them was striking. This is the music room. Augusta announced, pushing open a heavy oak door. Father says it hasn't changed since our grandmother's day. Evelyn stepped inside, taking in the faded grandeur. Heavy velvet curtains framed tall windows, and portraits of stern-faced ancestors gazed down from the walls. A pianoforte stood near the darkened fireplace, half covered in a white drop cloth. In one corner stood a beautiful harp, its strings gleaming in the afternoon light. Do either of you play? Evelyn asked, gesturing towards the instruments. A flicker of something, pride, perhaps, crossed Augusta's face. I do, she said softly. Father says I have a talent for it. Julia rolled her eyes. She's always plucking away at that thing. It's dreadfully dull. And what do you prefer, Julia? Evelyn asked, sensing an opportunity to draw her out. Julia's eyes sparkled. The piano, she announced. Evelyn smiled warmly at the girls. I'd be delighted to hear you play. Would you mind giving me a little performance? Augusta nodded, her movements graceful as she approached the harp. She settled herself on the small stool, her back straight and shoulders relaxed. As her fingers touched the strings, Evelyn marvelled at the girls' poise. Augusta's eyes closed, a look of serene concentration settling over her features. The first notes rang out, clear and crisp. Augusta's hands moved with precision, each pluck of the strings deliberate and controlled. The melody that emerged was hauntingly beautiful, speaking of hidden depths beneath the young girl's reserved exterior. When Augusta finished, Evelyn was blinking back unexpected tears. That was lovely, she murmured. Julia, not to be outdone, bounded over to the pianoforte. My turn, she announced, whipping off the drop cloth with a flourish that sent dust motes dancing in the air. Where Augusta had been all careful control, Julia was pure exuberance. Her fingers flew over the keys, the tempo wild and erratic. She hit wrong notes here and there, but her enthusiasm was infectious. Evelyn was tapping her foot, 
caught up in Julia's joy. As the last echoes of Julia's spirited performance faded, both girls turned expectant faces towards their new governess. Do you play, Miss Bain? Augusta asked, her tone polite but curious. Evelyn's smile turned wistful. I did, once upon a time, she admitted. The pianoforte, actually. But it's been... Oh, many years since I last touched the keys. Why'd you stop? Julia asked, her head tilted to one side. Evelyn paused, memories of her marital home flitting through her mind. Life has a way of changing our paths, she said carefully. Sometimes the things we loved in our youth get left behind. Julia wrinkled her pert little nose at that, clearly finding the idea of giving up something she loved preposterous. Augusta, however, tilted her head thoughtfully, considering Evelyn carefully. Evelyn glanced at the ornate clock on the mantelpiece, suddenly aware of how much time had passed it. She clapped her hands together, drawing the girl's attention. Come now, we've much more to learn if you're to be accomplished young ladies. Music is but one facet of a well-rounded education. Augusta's brow furrowed, her lips pursing in a way that reminded Evelyn startlingly of the Baron. The girl cast a longing look at her beloved harp as she rose from the stool. I fail to see what could be more important than perfecting one's art, Augusta said, her tone clipped. Evelyn bit back a smile. How like herself Augusta was at that age, so certain, so focused. There's much a young lady must know to enter society. Surely you don't mean to teach us how to flutter fans and arrange flowers for dinner parties, Augusta scoffed, her disdain palpable. The vehemence in the girl's voice caught Evelyn off guard. She'd expected some resistance, but this level of scorn towards social graces was surprising. Before she could formulate a response, Julia piped up. Oh, but that sounds rather fun. Julia's eyes sparkled with interest. Do you know all about London society, Miss Bain? Have you been to grand balls? Evelyn's chest tightened at the eager curiosity in Julia's voice. Memories of glittering chandeliers and swirling gowns threatened to overwhelm her, but she pushed them aside. I've attended my fair share, she said carefully, but there's more to being a lady than just socialising. It's about carrying oneself with grace and dignity in all situations. Augusta's frown deepened. Father says we're not to concern ourselves with such frivolities. Evelyn's heart skipped a beat as Julia leaned forward, eyes shining with curiosity. Did you dance with many gentlemen at the balls, Miss Bain? Were they terribly handsome? The eager question caught Evelyn off guard. She glanced at Augusta, noting the girl's sharp gaze fixed upon her. It was clear that each sister sought very different answers, and Evelyn knew she must tread carefully. Well, Evelyn began, choosing her words with care. I did. But you know, there's so much more to those events than just dancing with gentlemen. Julia's face fell slightly, but Augusta's posture relaxed a fraction. Evelyn continued. In fact, some of the most interesting conversations I had were with other ladies. We'd discuss books, art, and even politics on occasion. Politics? Augusta's eyebrows rose, a flicker of interest crossing her face. Of a sort, Evelyn nodded, seizing the opportunity. For instance, let's say that you must host a dinner with the great and good of the county. Who do you seat closest to you? Who will be offended by being seated far away? Who do you allow to escort you into the dining room? All of these things mean something in society. If you offend the wrong person, well, maybe they'll simply snub you. Or, she said, fixing each girl with a pointed look, perhaps they will refuse to buy any of the produce from your estate. What will that mean for your tenants? The twins exchanged a look, clearly never having considered such a thing before. Evelyn, sensing their shift in perspective, pounced. A well-rounded education prepares you for all manner of situations. Which is why, she added, inspiration striking, I propose a bit of an exchange. Both girls looked at her quizzically. You see, Evelyn explained, I'm woefully unprepared for country life. 
Perhaps we could learn from each other. I'll teach you about the wider world, including how to navigate social situations, whether you choose to engage with them or not. In return, you can help me understand more about life here in the countryside. Julia bounced on her toes. Oh, yes! We can show you how to gather eggs without getting pecked. Augusta's lips twitched in what might have been the ghost of a smile. I suppose there's merit in understanding social conventions, even if one chooses not to participate. Evelyn felt a wave of relief wash over her. Excellent. Then we have an agreement. Now shall we start with a tour of the grounds? I'd love to see where you spend your time outdoors. As they headed towards the door, Evelyn caught Augusta studying her once more, a thoughtful expression on her face. It seemed she'd passed some unspoken test, at least for now. James slumped in his chair, the weight of the day pressing down on his broad shoulders. His study, once a sanctuary, now felt like a prison. The ledgers before him swam with figures, each one a reminder of the mounting challenges facing his estate. He scrubbed at his face, the rough skin of his scarred hand catching on his stubble. The fire crackled in the hearth, but its warmth failed to reach him. Outside, the sun was sinking, painting the sky in hues that called to him like a siren's song. Blast it all, he muttered, pushing away from the desk. His boots echoed on the polished floor as he strode to the window. The rolling hills of his land stretched before him, verdant and inviting. His fingers twitched, longing for the feel of a horse's reins or the smooth wood of a walking stick. A knock at the door interrupted his brooding. Enter, he barked, not turning from the view. Begging your pardon, my lord, came the hesitant voice of his steward. But there's been another setback with the new planting methods. Some of the tenants are threatening to abandon the experiment altogether. James's jaw clenched. Of course, another problem to add to the growing pile. He turned, fixing the man with a steely gaze. Tell them I'll meet with them personally tomorrow. We can't afford to lose ground on this. The steward nodded his greying head and retreated, leaving James alone once more. He paced the length of the study, restless energy thrumming through his veins. The walls seemed to close in around him, suffocating in their opulence. His eyes fell on the portrait of his late wife, her smile frozen in time. A familiar ache bloomed in his chest, mingling with the ever-present fear for his daughter's futures. He'd sworn to protect them, to keep them safe from the pain he'd endured. But at what cost? The laughter of children drifted through the open window, and James found himself drawn back to it. In the fading light, he could just make out the forms of his girls in the garden, the new governess hovering nearby. Miss Evelyn, with her city airs and endless chatter. He'd been certain she'd have fled back to London at the first splatter of mud, but she seemed to be a stubborn little thing. James leaned against the window frame, one arm above his head, his gaze fixed on the scene unfolding in the garden below. His daughters, Augusta and Julia, darted across the lawn, their laughter carried on the evening breeze. The sight of them so carefree should have warmed his heart, but a familiar knot of anxiety tightened in his chest. He expected Miss Bain to intervene at any moment, to call the girls to order with stern words about proper behaviour. It was what their previous governess would have done, what any sensible woman charged with their care and education ought to do. But as he watched, Miss Bain merely smiled, her face softening with an indulgent expression as the girls tumbled about with his hunting dogs. James frowned, perplexed. This wasn't at all what he had anticipated from the prim and proper Londoner who had arrived on his doorstep. He'd been certain she'd try to mould his wild country girls into refined young ladies, all airs and graces with no substance. Yet here she was, allowing them their freedom their joy. As if sensing his scrutiny, Miss Bain glanced up towards his study window. Their eyes met for a brief moment, and James felt an unexpected jolt. He stepped back out of sight, his heart racing as if he'd been caught doing something unseemly. When he dared to look again, 
Miss Bain was moving to follow the girls across the uneven ground of the kitchen garden. Her step faltered, and she stumbled slightly, catching herself with a grace that belied her city upbringing. The girls turned back, concern evident in their postures. They said something to their governess, and to James's surprise, Miss Bain threw back her head and laughed. The sound carried up to him, clear and unrestrained. It was a far cry from the nervous chatter that had filled his wagonette on the day of her arrival. For a moment, James felt a pang of something he couldn't quite name. Envy, perhaps, at the easy rapport she seemed to be developing with his daughters. Or maybe... He shook his head, banishing the thought before it could fully form. Despite his best efforts, James found his gaze drawn back to Miss Bain once again. Her bonnet had come loose and was hanging down her back, revealing thick chestnut hair that gleamed in the setting sun. This irritated James further for some reason he couldn't quite name. He clenched his jaw, fingers tightening on the window frame. What business did she have looking so, so carefree? So at ease in a world that was meant to be foreign to her? And why in God's name did it matter to him? James turned abruptly from the window, determined to put the vexing governess out of his mind. He strode back to his desk, each step feeling heavier than the last. The ledgers awaited him, a mountain of figures and responsibilities that demanded his attention. He lowered himself into his chair, the leather creaking beneath him. His hand reached for the quill, but his eyes refused to focus on the columns before him. Instead, they kept straying to the window, to the fading laughter outside. James growled in frustration, running a hand through his unkempt hair. This was ridiculous. He was a grown man, a baron with an estate to manage and daughters to protect. He had no time for, for whatever this distraction was. Yet even as he berated himself, he found his body betraying him. He half rose from his chair, drawn inexorably back towards the window and the scene beyond. It took every ounce of his considerable willpower to force himself back down, to pick up the quill and bend his head over the ledgers. The numbers swam before his eyes, meaningless squiggles that refused to resolve into anything coherent. James gritted his teeth, determined to focus, to lose himself in the familiar rhythm of accounts and projections. But the memory of Miss Bain's laugh, of her hair catching the light, lingered at the edges of his mind like a persistent ghost. James's gaze drifted from the ledgers, settling on a letter tucked beneath a stack of papers. He pulled it out, recognising it as Miss Bain's acceptance of the governess position. Her handwriting caught his eye. Clean and precise, yet with a distinctly feminine flourish to the loops and curves. He ran a callous thumb over the words, noting how she had agreed to his stipulation of a trial period. A month, he'd insisted upon. Surely that would be enough time to determine if she was a good fit for his household, for his girls. James leaned back in his chair, the leather creaking softly. He tried to focus on the practicalities of the arrangement, to view Miss Bain as nothing more than an employee. Yet unbidden, the image of her laughing in the garden rose in his mind. He shook his head, irritated with himself. This wouldn't do at all. If the woman proved too much of a distraction, he need only dismiss her at the end of the trial. It was a simple solution, one that should have eased his mind. Instead, James found himself frowning at the thought. The girls seemed to be warming to her, and despite his initial misgivings, Miss Bain appeared to be determined to adapt to their household. He folded the letter, creasing it perhaps more sharply than necessary. No, he mustn't allow himself to become entangled in such thoughts. The trial period was a safeguard, nothing more. If Miss Bain's presence continued to unsettle him, he would simply have to. James paused, realising he had no idea how to finish that thought. The prospect of dismissing her no longer held the reassurance it once did. Chapter 10 Evelyn sat at the head of the dining table, her back straight and her hands folded neatly in her lap. Augusta and Julia flanked her on either side, their faces a mix of curiosity and mild boredom. 
Now, girls, Evelyn began, her voice soft but firm, when engaging in conversation with a gentleman at the table, one must strike a delicate balance. You wish to be engaging without appearing overly eager. A look of confusion crossed Augusta's face. But why should we care what they think of us? Evelyn suppressed a smile. It's not about their opinion of you, my dear. It's about maintaining your own dignity and reputation. Julia leaned forward, her eyes sparkling. How does one appear interesting without being too forward? An excellent question, Evelyn replied. The key is to... The door swung open with a creak, cutting off Evelyn's words. Baron Hastings strode into the room, his tall frame filling the doorway. His eyes darted from Evelyn to his daughters, a frown etching deep lines around his mouth. What's all this then? he asked, his voice gruff. Evelyn's heart quickened, but she kept her composure. Good afternoon, Baron. We were just discussing the finer points of dinner conversation. The Baron's eyebrows shot up. Dinner conversation? Is this what you are spending your time on? Of course, Father, Julia chimed in. Miss Bain was about to tell us how to speak with gentlemen without appearing too forward. The Baron's frown deepened. Gentlemen? What gentlemen? Evelyn felt a flush creep up her neck. It's merely a hypothetical situation, Baron. I assure you we're not planning any mixed dinner parties. See that you don't, he growled. His gaze lingered on Evelyn for a moment longer than necessary, and she felt a strange flutter in her chest. Evelyn lifted her chin, refusing to be cowed by the Baron's intimidating presence. A spark of defiance ignited within her, overriding her sense of decorum. I beg your pardon, Baron, but this is an important part of a young lady's education. The Baron's eyes flashed. It won't be a part of these young ladies' education. You're not allowing me to do my job, Evelyn retorted, her voice rising slightly. She was acutely aware of how improper her behaviour was, but she couldn't seem to stop herself. You had specific instructions, the Baron fired back, his jaw clenching. Augusta and Julia's heads swivelled back and forth between their father and governess, their eyes wide with fascination. The tension in the room crackled like static electricity. Evelyn stood her hands braced against the table. And those instructions were to prepare them for independence. How can they be truly independent if they can't navigate social situations? The Baron took a step forward, his presence looming. They won't need to navigate those situations if they never enter them. That's utterly unrealistic, Evelyn scoffed, her cheeks flushed with emotion. It's my decision, the Baron growled his voice low and dangerous. Evelyn opened her mouth to argue further, but caught herself. She glanced at the girls who were watching the exchange with rapt attention and realised how far she'd overstepped. She closed her mouth sharply with a click of her teeth. The Baron, clearly taking this as a sign of victory, straightened with a slightly smug tilt to his chin. Evelyn watched as the Baron turned on his heel, preparing to leave the dining room. His broad shoulders were set in a rigid line, radiating an air of superiority that made her blood simmer. The way he carried himself, as if his word was law and not to be questioned, struck a raw nerve within her. Memories of the judge's controlling manner flashed through her mind, and something inside Evelyn snapped. She would not be cowed by another man, not ever again. Without thinking, she hurried after the Baron, her nostrils flaring and eyes flashing. Baron Hastings, she called, her voice sharper than she'd intended. A word, if you please. He paused at the threshold, turning slowly to face her. His grey eyes were stormy, but Evelyn refused to be intimidated. She lifted her chin, meeting his gaze squarely. I believe we have more to discuss regarding your daughter's education, she said her tone clipped and formal despite the anger coursing through her veins. The Baron's jaw tightened. I thought we had settled the matter, Miss Bain. Settled? Evelyn let out a short, incredulous laugh. Hardly. 
You cannot simply dictate terms without considering the consequences. She was dimly aware that she was overstepping her bounds, that her position hung by a thread, but she couldn't seem to stop herself. The words tumbled out, fueled by a righteous indignation she hadn't known she possessed. Your daughters deserve a complete education, one that prepares them for all aspects of life. You cannot shelter them forever, my lord. The Baron's eyes narrowed dangerously, and he turned his face more fully toward her, giving her an unobstructed view of the scars that ran up the side of his face. It was clearly meant to intimidate her, but to her credit, Evelyn stood her ground. I can, and I will. You forget your place, Miss Bain. His dismissive tone only served to stoke the flames of Evelyn's anger. She took a step closer, her hands clenched at her sides. My place, she hissed, her voice low but intense. My place is to educate and guide your daughters to the best of my ability. If you cannot see the value in that, then perhaps it is you who has forgotten his place as a father. Evelyn's heart pounded in her chest as the silence stretched between them. She wondered if she had truly gone too far this time, her words hanging in the air like a challenge. Inwardly, she felt a twinge of regret for her sharp tongue, but outwardly she kept her face set in a mask of determination. The Baron stared at her, his grey eyes unreadable. Evelyn could almost see the thoughts churning behind his stern visage, weighing the merits of continuing their argument. She braced herself for another verbal assault, her chin lifted defiantly. I have bigger problems to attend to at the moment, he said at last as if that were the sword that cut off their argument with finality. He strode away from Miss Bain and was at the front door before she gathered herself up and hurried after him once again. Evelyn hurried after the Baron, her skirts rustling as she caught up to him at the front door. A footman was already there, handing him his hat and a sturdy walking stick. She felt a flicker of frustration at his dismissive attitude. My lord, she said, her voice firm despite her racing heart. We are not finished with this discussion. There's more to settle on this score. The Baron paused, one hand on the doorknob. He turned to face her, his grey eyes unreadable beneath the brim of his hat. For a moment they stood in silence, the tension palpable between them. Finally he spoke, his voice low and measured. Miss Bain, I hope you can argue and walk at the same time because I cannot devote any more time to this discussion while standing still. Without waiting for her response, he strode out onto the gravel drive. Evelyn blinked in surprise, then gathered her skirts and hurried after him. She was not about to let this matter drop so easily. As she fell into step beside him, Evelyn realised she had never been this close to the Baron before. His long strides forced her to walk at a brisk pace, and she could smell the faint scent of leather and tobacco that clung to his coat. It was oddly distracting, but she pushed the thought aside, focusing on the task at hand. My lord, she began slightly breathless from the exertion, I understand your concerns for your daughter's welfare, but surely you can see the importance of a well-rounded education. The Baron kept his gaze fixed ahead, his jaw set in a stubborn line. I see the importance of keeping them safe, Miss Bain. The world is not kind to young women who are unprepared for its harsh realities. Evelyn felt a pang of empathy at his words, recognising the fear that lay beneath his gruff exterior. Yet she pressed on, determined to make him understand. Evelyn took a deep breath, steeling herself for the argument ahead. She could feel the Baron's stubbornness radiating off him in waves, but she refused to back down. My lord, she began. Her voice was steady despite her racing heart. I must point out that if we don't teach the girls how to interact with gentlemen, they will be wholly unprepared when the time comes that they must do so. The Baron's frown deepened, etching harsh lines around his mouth. He stopped abruptly, turning to face her with a thunderous expression. They won't ever need to, Miss Bain. It's a waste of time. Evelyn felt a flicker of frustration at his obstinance. 
She opened her mouth to argue further, but he cut her off with a sharp wave of his hand. If you're so pressed for ideas on lessons, spend more time on mathematics, he growled. I don't want them wasting any time on silly nonsense like dancing or how to hold a parasol. His dismissive tone made Evelyn's cheeks flush with indignation. She took a step closer, her eyes flashing with determination. With all due respect, Baron, those skills are not silly nonsense. They are essential for young ladies to navigate society, regardless of whether you wish them to or not. The Baron's jaw clenched, and Evelyn could see the muscle ticking in his cheek. She knew she was treading on dangerous ground, but she couldn't let this go. The girl's future was at stake. Society, he spat the word as if it left a bad taste in his mouth. What society do you think there is to be had out here? He said, gesturing broadly with a sweep of his arm. Evelyn glanced about herself, realising that the Baron's brisk walking had led them farther than she had thought. In a field across the lane, a pair of cows watched them with lipid eyes, chewing great mouthfuls of grass lazily. Evelyn watched as the Baron nodded triumphantly, a self-satisfied smirk playing at the corners of his mouth. He clearly thought he'd made an irrefutable point about the girl's isolation. Without another word, he set off again, his long strides carrying him swiftly towards the cow's enclosure. Evelyn's eyes widened as she watched him approach the stile. Surely he didn't expect her to. But he did. With practised ease, the Baron stepped up and over the wooden structure, landing gracefully on the other side. He turned back to her, his eyebrows raised in challenge. The message was clear. He thought this would be too much for her, that she'd turn back now, effectively ending their argument. A spark of defiance ignited in Evelyn's chest. She'd be damned if she let him win so easily. Gathering her skirts in one hand, she approached the stile with determination. It was higher than she'd anticipated, and for a moment doubt crept in. But the sight of the Baron's smug expression steeled her resolve. Taking a deep breath, Evelyn placed one foot on the first step. Her shoes, more suited to London drawing rooms than country fields, offered little purchase on the worn wood. She wobbled slightly but pressed on, gripping the top of the stile with white-knuckled hands. With an ungainly movement, she swung her leg over the top. For a terrifying moment, she teetered precariously, certain she would topple over in an undignified heap. But then, with a final push, she made it to the other side. Her landing was far from graceful. Her feet slipped on the damp grass and she stumbled forward, arms windmilling as she fought to keep her balance. By some miracle she managed to stay upright, though her heart pounded wildly in her chest. Straightening up, Evelyn met the Baron's astonished gaze. His eyes were wide with surprise, clearly not having expected her to follow. A small, triumphant smile tugged at her lips as she brushed a stray lock of hair from her face. You were saying, my lord? she asked, her voice steady despite her breathlessness. Evelyn watched as the Baron set off again, his long strides carrying him down the field with grim determination. The ground beneath her feet grew softer with each step, and she silently cursed her choice of footwear. Her delicate shoes, more suited to London drawing rooms than muddy country fields, sank into the earth with alarming ease. Still, she refused to be deterred. Gathering her skirts higher, she hurried after the Baron, her mind racing as she tried to formulate her next argument. The squelching sound of her shoes in the mud was most undignified, but she pressed on, unwilling to let him win this battle of wills. My lord, she called out slightly breathless from the exertion. Surely there must be occasions for socialising even out here in the country. The Baron's response was a derisive snort, tossed over his shoulder without breaking his stride. Evelyn's face tightened in focus. Her brows slightly furrowed as she picked her way through the increasingly treacherous terrain. Her eyes darted between the ground and the Baron's retreating back, trying to find the safest path while keeping up with his relentless pace. Suddenly an idea struck her. What about harvest festivals? she asked, her voice carrying across the field. Or country fairs?
Surely such events are common in these parts? She resorted to hopping from foot to foot, trying not to sink deeper into the mud as she followed him. Evelyn noticed the Baron's pace slowing, and a flicker of triumph sparked within her. She had struck a chord and she wasn't about to let this advantage slip away. Carefully picking her way through the muddy field, she pressed on. My lord, what about tenant suppers after the harvest? I've heard it's quite a common celebration among country estates. Surely your daughters would be expected to attend such gatherings. The baron's shoulders stiffened, but he didn't turn to face her. Evelyn took his silence as encouragement to continue. And if your daughters are to inherit the estate one day, she ventured, her voice growing more confident despite her precarious footing, wouldn't it be their duty to host such events? To maintain good relations with the tenants and oversee the running of the estate? She watched as the baron's steps faltered slightly, his hand tightening on his walking stick. Evelyn held her breath, waiting for his response. She knew she was treading on delicate ground, both literally and figuratively, but she couldn't back down now. That's... different, the baron finally grumbled, his voice low and reluctant. Evelyn sensed an opening and pressed on, her words coming out in a rush. But it's not, my lord. These are precisely the sort of social situations the girls need to be prepared for. They'll need to know how to converse with people from all walks of life, how to manage a household, how to host gatherings. These skills are essential, whether they marry or not. The Baron came to a complete stop, turning to face her with a conflicted expression. Evelyn could see the internal struggle playing out across his features, a deep line formed on his forehead as he considered his thoughts. Evelyn watched the Baron's face intently, searching for any sign of concession. To her surprise, his expression softened slightly, the harsh lines around his mouth easing. For a moment, she dared to hope that she had finally broken through his stubborn resolve. But then something shifted in his eyes. The corners of his mouth twitched, and a bemused look spread across his features. Evelyn felt her earlier triumph evaporate, replaced by a prickle of defensiveness. Chapter 11 What, pray tell, are you smiling at, my lord? She demanded, her chin lifting in defiance. The baron said nothing, his grey eyes twinkling with barely suppressed mirth. Instead, he glanced pointedly downward, his gaze settling on Evelyn's feet. Confused, Evelyn followed his line of sight. Her eyes widened in horror as she realised her predicament. While she had been so focused on their argument, her feet had been steadily sinking into the muddy field. Her once pristine shoes were now completely submerged, the hem of her dress dangerously close to the muck. A small, undignified squeak of alarm escaped her lips as she tried to lift one foot only to find it firmly stuck in the thick, glutinous mud. The more she struggled, the deeper she seemed to sink. A small sound like a breathy chuckle escaped from the baron, and Evelyn turned a dour look on him, her eyes narrowed. Don't you dare laugh, she said, her voice low and dangerous. These shoes are from Madame Lucine's, and made from custom duchesse satin. Evelyn felt her cheeks burn with embarrassment as the baron's grin widened. His amusement at her predicament was infuriating, and she bristled at the thought of appearing foolish before him. When he extended his hand to help her, she pointedly turned away, determined to extricate herself from this mess without his assistance. Gathering her strength, Evelyn gritted her teeth and yanked her right leg upward with all her might. The mud released her foot with a horrible squelching sound that echoed across the field. She wobbled precariously, fighting to maintain her balance on her one free leg. To her dismay, she realised her shoe had remained firmly lodged in the muck. Evelyn glanced up at the Baron, her face flushed with exertion and frustration. He leaned casually on his walking stick, looking for all the world as if he had nowhere else to be but here, watching her struggle. His nonchalant attitude only served to fuel her determination. Evelyn refused to give him the satisfaction of seeing her defeated by a patch of mud. With a defiant lift of her chin, 
She placed her stockinged foot down on a nearby clump of weeds, wincing slightly at the dampness that immediately seeped through the delicate fabric. Using this precarious foothold, Evelyn braced herself to free her other foot. She could feel the Baron's eyes on her, but she refused to meet his gaze. Instead, she focused all her energy on the task at hand, silently vowing that she would rather ruin every stitch of clothing she owned than admit defeat. Evelyn gritted her teeth, determined to free her left foot. With a mighty heave, she wrenched it from the mud's grasp. The sudden release caught her off guard, and she felt herself losing balance. Her arms windmilled frantically as she teetered backwards, her heart leaping into her throat. Time seemed to slow as she fell, the sky above her spinning lazily. Then, with a sickening squelch, she landed flat on her back in the thick, cold mud. The impact knocked the wind from her lungs, leaving her gasping like a fish out of water. For a moment, Evelyn lay there, stunned and struggling to breathe. The earthy smell of mud filled her nostrils, and she could feel it seeping through her dress, coating her hands and face. She blinked rapidly, trying to clear her vision as muddy droplets trickled down her forehead. Suddenly, the Baron's face appeared above her, his expression transformed from amusement to genuine concern. He extended his hand, leaning down to offer assistance. Miss Bain, are you all right? Here, let me help you up, he said, his voice tinged with worry. Evelyn glared up at him, acutely aware of how ridiculous she must look. Mud splattered her once fine dress, caked her hands, and smeared across her face. Her carefully arranged hair had come loose, plastered to her head with muck. The urge to accept his help warred with her wounded pride. Drawing in a shaky breath, she fixed the Baron with a steely gaze. Not a word, she ground out between clenched teeth, her voice low and dangerous. Despite her fierce warning, Evelyn found herself reaching for the Baron's outstretched hand. His grip was strong and sure as he pulled her to her feet, the mud releasing her with a series of undignified sloppy sounds. She stumbled slightly, her stockinged feet slipping on the slick ground, and found herself steadied by the Baron's firm grasp on her elbow. As she regained her footing, Evelyn dared to glance up at her employer. The Baron's face was a study in forced solemnity his lips pressed into a thin line that twitched at the corners. She could see the mirth dancing in his grey eyes, barely contained beneath his serious expression. Miss Bain, he said, his voice remarkably steady, I must say you wear the countryside well. Evelyn felt her cheeks burn with a mixture of embarrassment and indignation. She shot him a look that could have curdled milk, silently daring him to continue. Undeterred, the Baron pressed on, his tone dripping with exaggerated sincerity. In fact, I don't believe I've ever seen you look more fetching. Evelyn glared at the Baron, her anger flaring hot and bright for a moment. How dare he mock her in this state? But as she looked down at herself, taking in the full extent of her muddy predicament, something shifted inside her. The absurdity of the situation struck her all at once, and before she could stop herself, a bubble of laughter escaped her lips. The sound of her own mirth startled her, but once it started, she found she couldn't stop. Evelyn laughed, a full, rich sound that echoed across the field. She caught sight of the Baron's face, his expression one of utter bewilderment, which only made her laugh harder. When she finally caught her breath, Evelyn grinned up at him, her eyes sparkling with mirth. You know, my lord, she said, still chuckling, all the ladies in London talk of going on great scenery tours of the English countryside, but I rather doubt any of them meant quite like this. The Baron blinked, clearly taken aback by her sudden change in demeanour. Evelyn pressed on, emboldened by his surprise. In fact, she added, gesturing to her mud-caked form, I've heard tell of ladies at Bath who put mud on their skin to improve their complexions. Perhaps I've stumbled upon a new beauty treatment. To Evelyn's astonishment, the Baron's stern facade cracked. The corners of his mouth twitched, and then, to her utter amazement, he smiled. It was a genuine smile that transformed his entire face. 
softening the harsh lines and bringing a warmth to his grey eyes that she had never seen before. Well, Miss Bain, he said, his voice tinged with amusement, if that's the case, I dare say you won't age for years to come. Evelyn's laughter faded as she caught the Baron's eye, a curious warmth spreading through her chest. His smile, so rare and unexpected, transformed his face entirely. The skin marred by the burn scar softened, and his grey eyes sparkled with an unfamiliar light. For a moment she forgot her muddy state, captivated by this glimpse of the man beneath the stern exterior. Then, as if forgetting himself, the Baron reached up and swiped some mud off Evelyn's face. His callous thumb grazed her skin, almost brushing across her lips. The touch, rough yet gentle, sent a jolt through her body. They both froze at the contact, the Baron's hand paused by Evelyn's chin. Evelyn stared up into his eyes, suddenly aware that she was breathing hard as if she'd been running. Her heart thundered in her chest and she felt a flush creeping up her neck that had nothing to do with embarrassment. The Baron stared right back at her, his eyes burning with an intensity that made her breath catch in her throat. Time seemed to stand still. The cold mud seeping through her clothes, the squelch of the field beneath her feet, even the gentle breeze, all faded away. There was only the Baron's burning gaze and the warmth of his hand near her face. Evelyn felt herself teetering on the edge of something vast and unknown, both thrilling and terrifying. She watched as the Baron's eyes flickered to her lips for the briefest moment, and she felt a rush of heat course through her body. The air between them crackled with tension, thick and heavy. Evelyn's mind raced, torn between the urge to step closer and the instinct to pull away. Evelyn felt the moment shatter as the Baron's expression suddenly hardened. The warmth in his eyes vanished, replaced by a cold, almost angry look. It was as if a wall had slammed down between them, leaving her breathless and confused. Flustered, she glanced down at her feet, only to realise with dismay that they were once again sinking into the thick mud. She shifted uncomfortably, unsure how to extricate herself from this predicament without further embarrassment. Before she could formulate a plan, the Baron let out a frustrated sigh. Without warning, he bent down and scooped her up into his arms as if she weighed no more than a feather. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the full book. The full audiobook will be available on YouTube in a few days. What did you like the most? Comment below and share this video on your social media and with your friends. Watch one of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel like this video and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.